bridge is built to travel over A tree sings dead until the spring Ask questions children as you wonder You will learn the nature of all these things You will know your purpose Everything in life truly has its purpose. Has its purpose. Learn this and grow wise. Greetings all, greetings. Thank you so much for joining us this beautiful Saturday afternoon for our monthly Pan-African film series. I'm so excited. Look at all the hosts. You might have thought that APRP New Mexico was just me and Monica, but there's mad people. There's like 15 of us. So here there's more folks with us. My name is Onya Sanu. I'm an organizer with the All African People's Revolutionary Party New Mexico chapter, and I'll give my other comrades a chance to introduce themselves. Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Ashi from Denver, Colorado, occupied Ute land. Um, well, happy to be here. <laughs> uh -oh. 
Afro Phoenix. I'm, oh, Monique is frozen. Afro Phoenix, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, yes, I'm Afro Phoenix. I'm in Albuquerque also. And um, so good to be back with everyone. Pretty exciting today, it sounds like, with all the people in. Agreed. And Monique is unfortunately frozen, but hopefully she can join us again. Oh, she's, there's a second one of her joining. So we'll let her in. But this is our monthly Pan-African film series. We do this event on the second Saturday of each month. Every single month, we've been doing it for over two years. It's one of the oldest APIP New Mexico programs. But since the COVID-19 pandemic, we've been doing the event virtually. So today, we are very excited, excited to show a documentary about the history of the revolution, revolutionary struggles against colonialism in Africa, specifically the contributions that Cuba has made to African liberation on the continent. We get a lot of lies about Cuba living here in the United States. We hear it's an oppressive dictatorship. We hear it's racist. We hear socialism doesn't work. But the facts in the receipts show that when Africa called out for help in its struggles against oppression and its struggles against exploitation and its struggles against colonization, Cuba answered. No other place in the world answered as consistently as Cuba. Cuba showed up to support over 16 anti-colonial struggles on the African continent. And so the documentary we're going to show today is an overview of just a handful of those struggles and how Cuba showed up to support African liberation struggles against the repression of European imperialist powers and the U.S. as well. So like always, we're going to screen the movie for y'all today. It's about two hours long. And then after the movie is over, we're going to come back and have a group discussion, the four of us are going to talk about our thoughts and reflections that came up watching the movie, and we hope that you'll share yours with us as well. So because it's a long movie today, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. As a reminder, if you have any issues seeing or hearing the film, please put them in the comments wherever you're watching the stream, and we'll make sure to get my comments. And then also, please like and share this stream so you can get as many eyes on this true history as possible to counteract all the lies about Cuba and about Africa as well. So without further ado, let me start the film and we'll see you for the discussion in two hours. July 1991 in Havana. It is Nelson Mandela's first trip outside Africa since his release from 27 years of prison. But why would the legend of struggle against oppression decide that the first person he wants to thank for helping to end apartheid is Fidel Castro, the very man who is regarded in the West as an oppressor of his own people? Fidel Castro and 500,000 Cubans took part in the African wars, which ultimately ended colonialism. This little-known story began in 1960, only a year after Cuban revolutionaries triumphed. Their struggle had captured people's imagination, and the young feisty leaders, Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, emerged from three years of guerrilla war as heroes. The wave of independence in Africa was spreading like wildfire. That year alone, 17 African countries gained independence, and 30 others started their revolutionary armed struggle. African revolutionaries were looking to the Cubans as a model for their own independence. Cuba was living proof that David could beat Goliath. The great humanity has said basta and has been able to And its march of gigantes will not be stopped until conquistar the true independence. I wanted to refer specifically al doloroso caso del Congo, único en la historia del mundo moderno que muestra cómo se puede burlar con la más absoluta impunidad, con el cinismo más insolente, el derecho de los pueblos. Che Guevara was revolted, and his speech gave a clear signal that Cuba intended to act. The case of Patrice Lumumba in the Congo was symbolic of how African independence would be crushed by Cold War strategic interests. It was Lumumba's assassination that sparked a new era for many African revolutionaries, and with it started the epic of Cuba in Africa.
the Congo, one of the largest and richest countries on the continent. The Belgian colony was demanding immediate independence. Patrice Lumumba, the young articulate clerk, led the movement that negotiated a peaceful solution to end Belgian rule. On June 30th, 1960, King Baudouin arrived in Leopoldville, the capital named after his great uncle, to hand over power. Le roi Baudouin était dans une voiture découverte. Il saluait la foule, etc. Un Congolais s'est précipité sur la voiture. J'ai vu les, les gardes du roi dégainer. Et tout le monde avait peur, se disait, il va tuer le roi. Non, il a simplement sorti l'épée du roi de sa gaine. Et il s'est mis à danser avec cette épée. C'est très symbolique, ça. C'est comme s'il lui a arraché le pouvoir. On Independence Day, all the dignitaries assembled in Parliament. King Baudouin was to announce the transfer of power to the new government. Patrice Lumumba had just been elected prime minister. But the euphoria of independence did not last long. That same day, Lumumba lit a fire that spread through the entire continent. L'indépendance du Congo constitue l'aboutissement de l'œuvre conçue par le génie du roi Léopold II. Le discours du roi Baudouin, qui nous rappelait comment la Belgique nous a sortis de, de l'esclavage, comment ils ont lutté pour nous sortir des maladies du sommeil, et patati patata, ça a été un choc. Nous ne nous attendions pas à ce rappel malheureux, parce que... Nous estimions que le roi Baudouin n'avait plus de leçons à nous faire hein, ce jour-là. À ce moment-là, le monde va se lève, qui n'était pas programmé comme devant parler à ce moment-là. Il se lève et il parle. Il fait un discours très militant. Combattant de l'indépendance, aujourd'hui victorieux, je vous salue au nom du gouvernement congolais. Nous avons connu les ironies, les insultes, les coups que nous devions subir matin, midi et soir, parce que nous étions des nègres. Rappelez-vous comment on traitait le blanc par rapport au noir. Rappelez-vous dans les écoles quelle place nous occupions. Rappelez-vous tout l'apartheid. Alors évidemment, réaction immédiate de toute la délégation. D'abord, beaucoup d'agitation pendant que le monde parle. Qui oubliera en fait les fusillades ont péri tant de nos frères, ceux qui ne voulaient plus se soumettre au régime d'injustice, d'oppression et d'exploitation. C'était mal reçu par les Belges, mais nous, nous avons tout à fait répondu à nos, à nos aspirations. Et au moment du dîner, on demande à Lubumba de présenter des excuses. Il ne s'en fait pas. Il présente les excuses en disant « Je pensais que je devais dire à cet homme des choses, je les ai dites, donc si ça a blessé, je m'en excuse et je demande qu'on tourne la page et que nous puissions voir les choses autrement. » Mais il était trop tard. La majesté était lésée. Et la majesté les a décidé le soir même de se venger et tout a commencé. Lumumba wanted to govern independently, but there were only 30 university graduates in the Congo. So it was agreed that for the next five years, Belgium would continue to run the important departments of the new state, including the army. The soldiers felt excluded from the newly acquired freedom. Within days, they started a mutiny, which led to the breakdown of the entire country. The troops were roaming the streets, all armed, and uh, it was it was quite a racial problem. The mutineers were there, and they had uh, matiti, that's you know, bushes on their helmet, which was a sign that they were prepared for action. 
for combat. I can remember one yelling, Venez, venez, sale flamand. We were all dirty Flemish. That was some, some a, an expression that, that meant you were really bad and uh, we're going to kill you. More and more stories circulated about killing, rape, pillage, etc. It was, if you will, the Iraq of today. Le 10 juillet, le 10 juillet, retenez bien la date. Les militaires belges ont occupé l'aéroport de Njili ici. Ils ont organisé l'agression du Congo en disant puisque les militaires congolais mutinés se sont attaqués aux femmes, aux enfants et aux officiers, la Belgique n'avait plus aucun autre moyen de protéger ses ressortissants que de faire venir des troupes belges le 10 juillet. Dix jours après. Lumumba immediately turned to the US for support. The United States had never been a colonizing power, and their democratic principles seemed to guarantee support for people fighting for independence. Fidel Castro himself had chosen the US as his first stop for support when his revolution triumphed a year earlier. But like Castro, Lumumba's attitude did not go down well with the Americans. I was in the lobby of the embassy when this little the Congolese clerk came in and he said he wanted 24 visas. He didn't know what a visa was. I said, well, do you have passports to put the visas in? Ah, no, patron, he didn't. So I, I explained to him what a visa was. And I said, why do you need 24? Well, he said, uh, Lumumba is going to the States to see President Eisenhower. I said, oh, that's interesting told him ambassador, and he said, I'm not aware of it. So he checked, and Eisenhower said, well, if he comes, I'll, I'll be here. The movement couldn't have made a worse impression on the Secretary of State and his deputy and other people with whom he met there. He threatened, he asked for things, uh, including to have a woman sent around to his room. The visit was not a success, and it was clear that Washington would not come to his rescue. Just as Lumumba was leaving Washington, Cuba announced the nationalization of US companies and a trade embargo was immediately imposed on the island. Lumumba, like Castro, soon discovered that the Soviet Union was more than happy to help where the US would not. At this moment, Lumumba commits probably the second error. He takes the decision, he makes a telegram addressed to Khrushchev to ask him to send the army of the Union Soviet to come to chase the Belges. Ce télégramme, avant même qu'il ne sorte, est volé au secrétaire de Lumumba par son ancien directeur de cabinet qui s'appelait Candolo Damien. Larry Devlin s'accapare du télégramme, le transmet au gouvernement américain. We, we became aware of it almost immediately, and it came from uh, Congolese sources. Uh, that immediately alerted the Americans. I became wide-eyed at that. I said, ah, we have a problem here. He tried to play off the West against the East. It's an old game, but it was relatively new at that time in Africa. But Larry Devlin didn't take it like that. He took it to say, the proof is there, that the Lumumba communist is not consequent. Outre the fact that he insulted the king of the Belgium, he is a communist, so he has to chase the power. The Congo crisis was becoming more than just a local conflict in faraway Africa. The superpowers were taking a particular interest, especially Moscow, that had recently set up a bureau for aiding anti-colonial liberation movements. 
the Soviet Union was eager to help, or at least agreed to help, the legally elected Congolese government. It was in the last days of July when a squadron of our Illusion 14 transport planes about 10 left for Leopoldville. By the way, they landed in Athens at the airport, which was partly NATO base. It became a big noise. The whole noise about the Cold War started when we landed there. It was the first time that there'd ever been Soviets in that part of Africa, at least, certainly not in the Congo, and very few in the rest of Africa, because the colonial powers were not desirous of having the Soviets there. We believed, and I think it's true, that it was an attempt to hold Congo as a base, especially as a base of minerals for the United States, for the West. We should not forget that the first atomic bomb was done of those uranium found in Congo. There are only two countries in the world that supplied cobalt at that time, Soviet Union and the Congo. And cobalt is extremely important for jet engines and all sorts of high technology. And we could not get it from the Soviet Union because it was a security commodity. So Congo was our only source. I suspect that the people in Washington began wondering where are we going to get our cobalt from if, if uh, the Soviets managed to control that. The United States deplores the unilateral action of the Soviet Union in supplying aircraft and other equipment for military purposes to the Congo. The Soviet action, which seems to be motivated entirely by the Soviet Union's political designs in Africa. I must repeat that the United States takes a most serious view of this action by the Soviet Union. Eisenhower fumed about aggressive Soviet support for his opponents. Soviet military aid for Lumumba arrived in the Congo only one month after the first Soviet arms shipment had landed in Cuba. To make matters worse, Castro openly declared that he intended to use these weapons to export his revolution. Eisenhower decided to send the CIA into action. I received a message saying that uh... People were in Washington were highly concerned about the activities of the prime minister and that uh, they hoped that he would go, you know, to, it would be a change in the government. The next thing I knew, I received a cable saying that someone by the name of Joe would arrive in Leopoldville and I was to take my instructions from him. And the instructions were that I was to remove him physically from, <laughs> in other words, assassinate uh, Lumumba. I asked first, whose instructions are these? And he said, they come from President Eisenhower. The president wanted this done, and I, and I was to put together these poisons and bring them out to you. One of the poisons was a tube of toothpaste that had a poison in it, so that if he'd brushed his teeth with it. That was been the end of the man. All of these things I put in my safe because I didn't want them lying around the office. If somebody may say, may I use your toothpaste? <laughs> I felt that I had some pretty good operations going, and in the long term, my operations would achieve the objective of removing Lumumba from office but not killing him. The Congo plunged into utter chaos. In the confusion, two separate secession movements broke away from Lumumba's government. The country desperately needed to be brought under control. 
the United States started to worry about it because the Soviets were backing Lumumba. So President Eisenhower said, well, we may have to use NATO there to keep the Soviets out. But finally, uh, cooler heads prevailed, and they asked the UN Security Council to send a peacekeeping operation to the Congo. President Eisenhower made some very basic policies which are still in existence today. And he said that if there are troubles in Africa, we don't want to have to send troops there, or Europeans should not send troops. It should all be done by the UN. Lumumba thought that the arrival of the UN peacekeepers would help him bring stability. He was wrong. The UN mission provided the missing ingredient to oust his government. Lumumba had just promoted his personal secretary, Joseph Mobutu, to Army Chief of Staff. Mobutu was to coordinate with the UN troops to stop the country's descent into anarchy. Instead, he turned to Larry Devlin. Mobutu said that the army was very unhappy with the prime minister because he was turning the army over to the Soviets. He wanted to mount a coup d'etat, but there was one condition. They had to know that they would have the support of the United States government. I had tried and failed to achieve by legal means what they wanted, the United States government wanted. So I stood up and shook his hand. Finally, it took me a while to do this and said, I guarantee you the support of the United States government. And uh, the coup de, he said the coup will take place within a week, and it did. UN troops were supposed to protect the independence of Congo, but they would not allow the Congolese troops, which were loyal to Lumumba, to operate. The mission of the United Nations troops was misused to topple the regime of the government of Lumumba, or at least not to protect Lumumba. The troops of the Nations Unies will be the residence of the Premier Minister. Sans aucun mandat, sans aucune autorisation, il y a une crise interne. Les Nations Unies s'interposent et vont mettre le Premier ministre en résidence surveillée. Le Mumba's supporters organized his escape. He was sneaked out of his house, bundled up in the back of a government car. Le Bruxelles répond que le Mumba était parti de chez lui. On a commencé à le chercher. Mobutu a demandé aux Nations Unies de lui donner les hélicoptères, on l'a poursuivi, on l'a arrêté. On les a mis dans un hélicoptère, on l'a ramené ici, ligoté, comme un vulgaire bandit. Vous enlevez celui qui est le flambeau, l'icône, tout d'un coup, comme ça, et, et d'une façon très barbare, en utilisant les mains africaines. Alors c'était frustrant, c'était écœurant, c'était un appel à l'insurrection populaire. Il faut venger cela. Ce pays est à nous et je veux me battre pour lui. C'est elle étincelle qui m'a fait conduire sur le chemin du maquis, de la guérilla. A witch hunt tracking down Lumumba's followers started in the capital. One by one, the Lumumbas fled to the safe haven across the river in Brazzaville. They organized themselves into an armed rebellion led by the 23-year-old Laurent Kabila. Lumumba's assassination resonated throughout the world. The shock was felt clearly in Cuba, where a large percentage of the population traces its origins back to the Congo. Cuba's young revolutionary leaders were appalled. 
the island declared a three-day official mourning in honor of Lumumba's memory. Bajo la bandera de las Naciones Unidas en el Congo fue asesinado Lumumba. Y esas eran las Naciones Unidas que pretendían los norteamericanos que vinieran a inspeccionar nuestro territorio. Esas mismas Naciones Unidas. Cuba shared Africa's revolutionary quest for real independence. What happened to Lumumba could happen anywhere if no action was taken. Fidel Castro decided that Cuba could not stand by idly. So Che Guevara went on a two-month tour of Africa to assess how they could help local liberation movements. Nous sommes en train de construire le socialisme sur notre terre et mettons notre petit grain de sable au service de la grande aspiration de l'humanité. Che's public appearances hit the true objective of his mission. Cuba's future involvement in Africa was formulated at late night secret meetings with armed liberation movements from different parts of the continent. But Che's hopes were pinned on the Lumumbist rebellion because Kabila and his men had already captured two thirds of the Congo's territory. Je suis contacté par l'ambassade de Cuba qu'il y a un, une haute personnalité cubaine qui vient d'arriver qui aurait bien voulu avoir contact avec nous pour s'entretenir avec les leaders du mouvement de libération. Je me pointe à l'ambassade de Cuba. Je suis en face d'Ernest Che Guevara. Je me suis pincé moi-même. Je dis est-ce que c'est est vrai ou je, je n'en revenais pas. Pero no porque él confiara que el Congo iba a ser la base de la cual iban a irradiar las columnas para independizar a África. Está segura de eso. Independientemente de la frontera. Dentro de su concepción de la lucha revolucionaria, de lo que Debrey después llamó el foquismo, un foco guerrillero que irradia hacia las columnas. El Che partía de la ubicación del Congo para que fuera el epicentro de la irradiación de la independencia del África por la característica de las nuevas fronteras. Y dice, bueno, nos somos dispuestos de prestar mano fuerte. El objetivo es de formar el cadre de la revolución contra el neocolonialismo en Congo, donde hay ya un espacio muy amplio libre. Todo lo que él promete es la ayuda de Cuba al movimiento de liberación, con armas, logística, and an encadrement, not even the combatants. Cuba had not yet devised a clear strategy of how to help liberation movements. But for Che Guevara, one thing was certain. Revolutionaries of the world had to create two or three Vietnams to keep their common enemy occupied on several fronts at once. The solidarity of the weak, or as they labeled it, internationalism, was the only means to win an unequal battle. Che returned to Cuba and encouraged Fidel to give logistic support to African revolutions. He argued that Cuba could make a difference there, but he personally wanted to continue working in Latin America. When he to Cuba, he plantea esta conviction that he was not necessary here, porque ya la revolución cubana estaba consolidada y que él quería irse a otros pueblos. Pero lo primero que plantea es irse para América Latina. Y entonces, cuando se hace una valoración por Fidel y por todas nuestras dirigencias de la revolución, se llega a la conclusión de que todavía América Latina no tenía las condiciones de seguridad para que él fuera para allí. Está impaciente, pero él, él también la misión de África la apreciaba mucho. Y entonces yo le propongo eso. Se creen las condiciones de una tarea muy importante que hacer, que apoyar el movimiento guerrillero que está en el este contra Mobuto. Un buen día a finales del mes de enero fui llamado al Estado Mayor del Ejército Central. E inmediatamente me dijo, hace falta que empiece a reclutar a a un grupo de 30 compañeros de la lucha contra bandido y otro que tú conozcas. Que sean negros, bien negro era la palabra exacta en aquel momento, 
que estén dispuestos a, a cumplir una misión internacionalista, que puede ser que no regrese ninguno, me dice con claridad. For months, training was concealed in the depths of the Cuban forest. Soldiers were aware that the coming mission would be abroad, but none of them knew where or when it would take place. Drecke was the main contact with the leadership, but even he was in for a surprise. El compañero Manny se fue. Me va a ver y me dice, bueno, hay un comandante y te quiere saludar, que hace tiempo que no te ve, que es muy amigo tuyo. Y me lleva varias fotos de una persona, un hombre blanco. Y le digo, oye, Manny, yo no, no me acuerdo, no lo conozco. Este comandante yo no lo conozco, pero ¿dónde es yo? Ahí pasan los días. Inventé unas cuantas gente, dije que te haría que conocieran a un amigo interesantísimo. Admito a Raúl y a... Y estoy almorzando. Y veo un señor que está sentado por allá. Dice, señor Mari, mira, ahí está el comandante Ramón. ¿Tú no lo conoces? Yo no lo conozco. Hasta que el señor interviene y le dice, no chive más, Adri. Y le dice, yo soy el che. Ha sido una de las sorpresas más grandes que he tenido en mi vida, ¿no? Y ninguno lo conoció. Qué desistado de verdad, hijo. Sí, indiscutiblemente fueron muy capaces nuestra gente. ¿ves? Y él eh, va entonces a un lugar de Tirante Arriba. Tenía una casa y, no sé, y yo no sé, en ese lugar. Él escogió a la gente. Él quería. Y ahí sí enviamos un buen refuerzo con el chico. Fueron alrededor de 150 hombres. Bien armados. Y con una experiencia. Eso era vital para la revolución, que nadie conociera que era el Che. El Che, igual que Fidel y Raúl, son de los dirigentes más buscados por los terroristas internacionales, por el paralelismo yanqui, para asesinarlo. Traemos para acá para la mano. Eh, empezó a comprar eh, ropa, llevar ropa, ropa interior, esto, la maleta. Los traje. Se compraban por serie, ¿no? Serie, un montón de trajes, todos eran igual. Además, casi era la misma talla, casi todo. <ríe> y era calidad, más o menos igual, todo. Eh, la maleta, la maleta grandísima y todo eso, pero la maleta iba vacía. Ahora las dos camisas, dos calzoncillos. Porque el traje todo estaba puesto. Entonces, si todos éramos igual, negro, todos vestidos igual, llamaba la atención, ¿eh? Che Guevara's disguise was more discreet, and his group of 14 men landed in Tanzania without any prior warning. Che's presence had to remain secret, so his identity was not even divulged to the Lumumbists he had come to help. Kabila était toquer, on m'appelle, j'étais seul. On m'appelle, voilà, le groupe de d'instructeurs cubains est arrivé. À la tête se trouve le commandant Victor Drake, qui est un spécialiste du maquis. J'étais très impressionné. Et je suis devant Che Guevara, déguisé. Je ne le reconnais pas. Bon, Che, ça aussi, il y a un dictionnaire français et suahili pour aller ubicant le nom de chacun un de nos compagnons. Dans le cas de moi, je me pone le luno qui est Moya. Et ils, pour le premier, le luno, et le plus grand, et qui me demande le luno, il faut que je me mette à Moya. Il se pone le trait tatu como médico y como traductor, es decir, para que no hubiese duda de por qué Che, siempre que yo estaba, tenía que estar él. Alors, me dicen, ¿qué es que hacemos? Kabila no está aquí, no podemos ir a entrenar aquí, porque el servicio de espionaje británico trabaja aquí, americano trabaja aquí, francés trabaja aquí. Il faut organizar très, très, très vite la descente vers le front. Je fais une communication a Kabila par téléphone, je l'ai appelé au Caire. Il a dit, ben, eh, il faut m'attendre, je viens tout de suite. Moi, je dis, je ne peux pas attendre, je peux pas l'attendre. Je vais les amener. The Cubans were taken by motorboat to the Lumumba's eastern front on the opposite shore of Lake Tanganyika. En medio de la noche, muy, una noche muy oscura, sin mapa, sin una brújula, y ellos que sabían, y por ahí para allá, 
Y el barco aquí empieza a coger agua, empezamos a botar agua a todo el mundo, ahí a botar agua, a botar agua, porque no sabíamos, no se veía la orilla. Y aquí no se va a salvar nadie. Para... Y ellos encendiendo luces en medio de la noche para sacar el agua. Y el Che gritando, que no sientan las luces, y nosotros gritando y no nos entendían. Les noms qu'on nous a présentés, ce sont des noms numériques, quoi, arithmétiques, parce qu'ils disaient, voilà, celui-ci, c'est le commandant Moya, celui-ci, c'est Mbili, celui-ci, c'est Tatou. En Swahili, Moya, c'est un, Mbili, c'est deux, Tatou, c'est trois. Alors ça, on ne comprenait pas. Et on se demandait entre nous, on, en, comme un commentaire, quoi, mais ces gens-là, leur nom, c'est le numéro. Il y avait deux blancs. Et Moja, on nous a présenté que c'est le chef du groupe, qui est noir. Il disait que là, chez eux, au Akiba, qu'il n'y a pas de racisme. Mais c'était étonnant. C'était difficile de comprendre qu'il euh, y a des pays où un noir dirige un blanc. Parce que nous, on nous a enseigné pendant la colonisation que le plus fort, le plus intelligent et le plus beau, c'est le blanc. Alors, comment est possible maintenant, dans ce pays-là, il y a un petit noir là qui dirige le blanc? The Cubans arrived in eastern Congo, believing that Kabila's men control two-thirds of the country's territory. But the situation had changed dramatically since Che had met the Lumumba's leaders a few months earlier. In the meantime, a number of Lumumbists had changed sides. Cleofas Kamita too, was now Mobutu's Minister of Interior, and it was his job to crush the rebellion. Nous avons organisé une opération de récupération du pays en utilisant l'armée, les mercenaires, recruter. Seule la définition classique de mercenaires, il va au plus offrant. Qui leur a offert C'est les États-Unis qui ont offert l'argent par Mobutu interposé aux mercenaires pour qu'ils viennent combattre la rébellion. C'est les États-Unis. C'est Larry Devlin qui a dépensé tout l'argent pour empêcher la rébellion de gagner. Nous avions occupé une très grande partie de la, de la République. En avril 65, nous, nous venions de perdre presque tous nos grands centres. Il nous restait des poches à l'intérieur. Et il fallait nous réorganiser. C'est en somme au moment où nous, nous venons déjà de subir un grand coup sur le plan militaire que nous, nous aurons alors l'information maintenant de l'arrivée des camarades cubains. Kabila was bogged down in internal divisions after the astounding defeat. So when the Cubans arrived in the rebel territory, coordinating military activities with them was hardly a priority. Alors, Che m'interpelle. Il me dit, écoute, et je vais te dire une chose. Rentre, va dire à Kabila, je suis Che Guevara et je l'attends ici. Et moi, j'ai dit, mamma mia, je dis, ma... Que fue quand elle empieza à gritar allí, escándalo internacional, sale de la, de la cabañita de la barraca aquella con las dos manos puestas en la cabeza, escándalo internacional, escándalo internacional. Y dice, Che, cállate, cállate, pero no, que cállate, ¿no? Gritando por todo aquello, están eso. <laughs> Parecía que tenía un, un león detrás. <laughs> J'ai eu peur, j'ai eu une sueur froide le long de la colonne vertébrale. Je dis, ce n'est pas vrai. Quand je suis arrivé à Dar es Salaam, Kabila venait d'arriver du Caire, je l'ai raconté, et j'ai supplié Kabila d'aller rejoindre. Il a blémi avec sa face noire, il, a, il était sans drogue, il n'en revenait pas. C'était une grande responsabilité de cette personnalité, de l'envergure de Nest Che Guevara. L'inquiétude, c'était que si ça venait d'être connu par les Américains que Nest Che Guevara est au Congo, que tout allait être déversé sur le Congo. Mais nous étions contents que les camarades soient là. Mais pas, mais pas lui, pas, pas, pas Che. Che's force was intended as a backup for the guerrillas. 
But the movement was in disarray, so the Cubans were ordered to wait in the camp until further orders. Very quickly, they realized that there was a huge cultural gap between them and the Africans. On pouvait dire qu'on n'avait pas de troupes, parce qu'ils s'étaient désorganisés. Nous, normalement, on ne savait pas même pas des armes. On tirait, c'est tout. Alors, cela veut dire que je prenais une arme, je tirais devant, c'est fini. Sans direction de tir, sans une instruction. C'est chargé, tirer devant. Et là même, il fallait aussi avoir peur, parce qu'une balle de ton copain pouvait te prendre si tu n'es plus devant, comme il, avait, il ne savait pas la discipline de tir. Il y fusil, Ça, c'est très difficile pour le persuader, parce qu'il y avait un habit, je ne sais pourquoi, mais ils ne pouvaient pas fermer un ojo. Pour buscar le ojo de la directrice, ils ne pouvaient pas faire. Donc, il y avait que taparle. Pour faire la trinchera, teníamos ese problema también porque nos aducían que la trinchera era un hueco y que el hueco era para los muertos por lo tanto que ellos no se metían en una trinchera Communications were difficult and the Cubans were getting frustrated In June shortly before the anniversary of Congo's independence a messenger arrived with instructions to attack the major enemy garrison at Fort Bandera That was the turning point. Había que atacar ese día. Vamos a atacar, vamos a hacer una otra emboscada, vamos a atacar otro lugar con eso y sorprenderse, no, bandera. Entonces, si no le quedó más remedio desde el punto de vista político de aceptarla, porque era estábamos allí y era una negativa en el único momento que ellos venían a pedir que le hiciéramos algo y decirle que no. A las 5 de la mañana, hora de aquel país, empezamos a tirotear el cuartel a fuego rasante contra el cuartel. Esa era la señal de, del ataque. ¿No? Empezó el ataque. Ellos inmediatamente respondieron. Fue rapidísimo respondieron. Habían corrido ya la primera sangre. Era el primer combate que teníamos y ya habían cuatro muertos. Y la actitud que se había producido por parte de los guerrilleros congoleses, por lo que nos informaban los compañeros, no era muy bueno. Eso preocupó a Tato un poco. Él sabía que a partir de ahí le esperaba un, una situación bastante eh, embarazosa. The defeat at Fort Bandera and the death of four Cubans compromised the secrecy that the Cubans had taken so much trouble to maintain. Cuando los compañeros salen de Cuba, todo se le cambió la ropa. Nadie podía llevar nada que tuviera que ver con Cuba. Y hay un compañero que lleva un calzoncillo que decía, hecho en Cuba, que es uno de los compañeros muertos. Lleva un calzoncillo, cuando lo cogen, aparece un calzoncillo hecho en Cuba, aparece la característica, se percatan de que no son, no son africanos. There were rumors that there was a man known as Tattoo, who was Cuban. Che Guevara had disappeared from Cuba, so it Could it be? Well, I suggested to Washington this must be the case, and they told me I was out of my mind. Go on, don't, don't waste your time with ideas like that. But we did, because I had some people that were, uh, shall we say, in contact with the rebels, and working with them part of the time and part of the time against them. What we did, we did pictures of Che with beard, without beard, with mustache, no beard, with beard and mustache, Che with glasses, Che without glasses. And we showed them to these people. In one fight, I don't remember which combination it was, it came up with, ah, that's tattoo. <laughs> When I concluded it must be Che, that told me that this is a Soviet operation. They don't want to use their own troops, they use surrogates. It was clear that there weren't a great many, but more could come. Clearly, they were getting their supplies 
guns, ammunition, etc., coming across Lake Tanganyika. We supplied equipment to the Congolese to use, such as boats on the lake, to try and stop this supply chain that was coming. With the reinforcements, Mobutu's mercenaries started bombardments. The lake which was a lifeline for the rebels, was constantly patrolled. The situation was critical, and Che's presence in the area further complicated the problem. Pour le pied de rester à l'intérieur. Alors, nous avons profité de ça pour dire voilà, c'est vraiment pas le moment, ça devient trop dangereux pour le convaincre de quitter momentanément le pays. Il ne voulait pas décrocher, il ne voulait pas partir. Je, je vu même, je dis mais c'est que c'est suicidaire. Si cet homme-là meurt ici, quelle responsabilité historique oh, Il fallait prier Dieu, même s'il si n'y avait pas de croyance, même si parmi nous il y avait ceux qui ne croyaient pas tout à fait en Dieu. En tous les cas, il fallait que Tché ne tombe pas sur le sol congolais. Parce que si jamais cela pouvait nous arriver, mais on allait avoir sur nos têtes toute la condamnation des de, 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 de révolutionnaires du monde entier. Et nous serions traités de, de tous les noms. Mais Tché refused to leave. He insisted that the rebels should get organized. However, Che could not ignore the mounting international pressure against foreign troops in the Congo. The African Union met to condemn foreign intervention. Only this time, the African leaders did not just denounce Mobutu's mercenaries. They also criticized Cuba's support for the rebel forces. <laughs> Nosotros no fuimos, a, 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 no fuimos invasores, ni, somos, ni éramos mercenarios, ni fuimos a hacer la guerra. Nosotros fuimos a ayudar al movimiento de liberación, enseñándole a sus hombres y después incluso combatiendo junto con ellos. Pero si ellos no están dispuestos a combatir. Además, fue una cosa eh, muy, muy dolorosa, ¿no? Esta, esta situación. La gente cuando venía, veníamos pensando todos, ¿qué dirá Fidel? ¿Qué dirá Fidel? ¿Qué dirá el comandante jefe? ¿Qué dirá el comandante jefe? ¿Ya? Porque tenía una confianza absoluta en, en el triunfo. Como, como el Fidel. No, con el comandante que teníamos enfrente, el Che. No, no había otro mejor. El Fidel. Le manda un mensaje al Che. Si sí, hubiera habido que meter más tropas voluntarios había aquí. De sobra. Pero realmente yo no tenía perspectivas. Entonces yo le pedimos que se repliegue. Y a aquella gente en aquel fondo, pero entonces también le dijimos, pero bueno, que usted no es de aquí. ¿Entiende? Y usted está viendo, no es un problema interno de nosotros, ni interno de nadie, es una decisión de los pueblos africanos. Entonces ante eso no le quedó más remedio que retirarse. Y ya aceptó irnos. Concretamente, cuando ya nos íbamos, él me dijo, oye, nos vamos a retirar. El perrito que está ahí, no lo deje. Y ese era un perrito chiquitico que él tenía allí. Y entonces, pero yo iba cargado. Entonces, ¿dónde me llevo el perrito? Entonces, me lo metí por aquí. Me lo metí aquí, pero el perrito cuando va ahí, que vamos bajando la loma, que ya nos vamos retirando, ya nos dijo, nos vamos retirando, hay que tratar de llegar lo más rápidamente posible allí, ¿Entiende? Que vamos a establecer contacto con Changa, que está en el lago. ¿Entiende? Avanzamos. Y entonces el perrito me empieza a lamer. Y entonces aquello yo no lo podía aguantar. Y dije, oiga, voy a tener que botar el perro. Y me dijo, oye, aguanta con el perro ese que llegue hasta el lago. Y le dijo que habíamos perdido una batalla. Pero que no se había perdido la guerra. Quedaba mucho que hacer por la independencia de los pueblos y que esperaba que todos nosotros hiciéramos algo y que estuviéramos con ese espíritu de combatividad, de internacionalismo. Che's mission to the Congo had been a total failure. 
but that did not change Cuba's determination to continue its support for liberation movements. For Fidel Castro, it was the method, how and whom to help, that needed to be reconsidered. In January of 1966, only two months after Che retreated from the Congo, Cuba hosted an unprecedented gathering that included virtually every armed revolutionary movement from the three poorest continents. The Tri-Continental Conference reinforced the island's role as the leader of internationalism. For Fidel, this was a good opportunity to assess the qualities of the revolutionaries he wanted to support. It was undoubtedly Amilcar Cabral who stole the limelight. Cabral, only 31 years old, was leading a fierce struggle against the Portuguese empire in one of Africa's smallest and poorest nations, Guinea-Bissau. Esta conferencia, aquí en Cuba, territorio libre de América, el primer país socialista en el hemisferio occidental, es en realidad una gran promesa, una gran esperanza para todos los pueblos que luchan contra el imperialismo. Pero ya había una, un antecedente de América cuando se había entrevistado en el recorrido que hace el Che por distintos países que llega a Conakry, tiene la oportunidad de hablar con América. Y el Che dice que uno de los movimientos de liberación más serio que hay en ese momento y de más posibilidad en ese momento es el movimiento de la liberación de la colonia de Guinea Bissau y Cabo Verde. Après les grands discours de Fidel Castro, Amilcar Cabral fait un discours remarquable. Il a caractérisé, je m'appelle ça, très bien la situation en Afrique à partir de son propre pays, en parlant des ethnies, en parlant d'état de, de pauvreté, d'exploitation, pour justifier l'idée de conduire l'alternance. C'est parce qu'il n'y avait pas autre voie, parce que les grandes puissances s'opposaient à l'indépendance des colonies portugaises, par exemple. For years, Amilcar's struggle was not of much consequence. But when the guerrillas started capturing territory, suddenly the importance of this neglected colony became evident. For Portugal, much more was at stake in Guinea-Bissau. This tiny colony could prove to be the empire's Achilles heel. Y se liberaba Guinea Bissau y así se demostró después. Se desprendía la liberación del resto de los, de los países de, de habla portuguesa que es colonizado. Entonces, allí era estaba el eslabón más flojo que tenían de la cadena desde el punto de vista de los portugueses. No podían permitir, tuvieron hasta que hicieron todo el esfuerzo para no permitir que se dejara ninguna de las colonias, y mucho menos Guinea, que iba a ser el ejemplo del resto de las colonias para su liberación. Il n'avait pas beaucoup de richesse à ce moment-là. La Guinée devait recevoir de l'argent du Portugal. C'était un pays où on faisait l'agriculture, pas plus. L'agriculture arriérée, on faisait la Guinée. Et tandis que ce n'était pas le cas en Angola où il y avait des, des immigrés, qui, des commerçants, des hommes d'affaires. C'était des richesses, des richesses de l'Angola et de Mozambique qu'ils voyaient, parce que la Guinée n'a rien fait. The Portuguese were aware of their weakness, but they held a trump card. The government leased a strip of land on the Azores Islands to the U.S. Defense Department. That airbase was used to protect American allies in the east, like Israel and Saudi Arabia. But the lease was renewable annually, so Portugal had every intention to use the Azores airbase as a bargaining chip. Well, under the fascist regime uh, of Portugal, Angola and Mozambique and Guinea-Bissau were part of Portugal. So the idea of giving up these colonies uh, was unthinkable for that regime. So if we went to them and said, look, you must get out of Angola, we'll be very upset with you and all that, they could, might well have cut us out of the Azores. 
So uh, NATO and the Cold War was far more important to us. There was a special law about not allowing U.S. arms given to Portugal to use them in the, in the uh, in Africa, but they did violate it, and we didn't do anything about it. We, in fact, we did not cut them off, even though we knew that they were using them. Uma vontade me foi no meio da certa guerra lá entre leste e oeste, não um pavulho, não. Mas, malgré que beaucoup de gens disaient que bon, sont des communistes, sont des communistes, beaucoup de gens disaient ça, mais on n'avait pas de preuve. Como dizia Milcar, nós tínhamos des nationalistes africains, sem opção ideológica. Amilcar knew that it would be difficult to avoid labeling his movement, and having Cuban fighters would do little to dispel the belief that they were firmly allied to the Eastern Bloc. But he had a vision and a very clear strategy as to how to fight his battle for independence. Es decir, que América no llega pidiendo, deme hombre, mándeme hombre. ¿no? Teníamos la idea de que habíamos sacado ya del Congo, de que venían a venir más tropas de cubanos a ayudar a América. Y en aquel momento América no quería más tropas de cubanos. Son los guineanos que tienen que luchar. Y tú metes un batallón ahí, va a ser el batallón y no los cangros. Y tienen que aprender, mediante la lucha, prepararse para, cuando, para la victoria. Es una idea muy, aunque fuera un poco más larga la lucha, es una idea muy interesante. De ir forjando en medio de la lucha la nación. Hay que forjar una nueva nación, además, tribus diferentes, solo la lucha por unirla. Che's defeat in the Congo was still a fresh wound, and Fidel began to consider how his help could be more effective. This time, the bulk of Cuban support came in the form of artillery experts, doctors and technicians. Soldiers would go only if requested. They also took some lessons from their debacle in Congo. In Guinea-Bissau, the involvement was quite different. It was more of, in a good sense, technical nature of helping local forces of PAGC, the army, especially helping in those specialities when they had not been hadn't got enough expertise, you see, to fight Portuguese. So it's more of, in the good sense, supportive role, you see. Amilcar had no illusions about his capacity to defeat the mighty Portuguese empire. He wanted to wear them down in order to get them to the negotiating table. En la conversación que tiene Amica conmigo, en el, en el frente, él me explica, esa se basaba en no atacar los cuarteles con intenciones de tomarlo, porque no había suficiente fuerza en condiciones en ese momento para eso. Lo que quería era desangrar, hacerle baja, bastante baja al enemigo y hacer la vida imposible con ese tipo de, de, de combate. Hasta que se le haría la vida imposible en los cuarteles. The war escalated and the Portuguese sent 22,000 more soldiers. Amilcar's demoralization tactics had worked. The Portuguese felt trapped. Veteran captains from the colonial army in Guinea-Bissau decided to take the initiative in their own hands. It was they who overthrew the dictatorship, creating the Carnation Revolution in Portugal. And within months, the Portuguese colonial empire crumbled like a house of cards. In every this liberation movement, there was no military victory, never. And they did not destroy the colonial machine, but they created, even vis-a-vis -vis Algeria and the France for that matter, they created such a situation that before getting victory, they obliged, they forced the enemy to retreat.
to come to some compromise. Usually it's uh, in the form, it's compromise. In the essence, it's the victory of the liberation forces. That's exactly happened in each and every country. of revolutionaries gathered at Amilcar's tomb. Beside Fidel Castro stood Agostino Neto, the leader of Angola's liberation movement. Cuba had for years been supporting Neto's movement, but the scale of Fidel Castro's military involvement in Angola after the collapse of the Portuguese empire would soon change the face of the continent. que tenemos que hacer y Neto era como de que el, cada país debe ser dirigido por la gente del país The Angolan liberation struggle had been more complex from the start Other than Neto's MPLA Angola had two other rival anti-colonial movements Holden Roberto's FNLA was based in the north of the country and received arms and training from the U.S., mainly via Mobutu in Zaire. Jonas Savimbi's UNITA was based in the south, and they too got American support, which was mainly channeled through apartheid South Africa. For us, it was the continental camp, but it was not the same idea as us. And on the other side, there was a guy who was in the camp, Marxist-Leninist. Le communisme était l'opposé du christianisme. Eh bien, c'était clair, parce que si nous étions profondément chrétiens, je suis chrétien, ben, et la, la majorité de dirigeants de Fénin étaient des chrétiens et des militants, ben, on ne peut pas être d'accord avec le communisme. Le monde était divisé, ouest et est. Ceux qui étaient supportés par l'URSS n'étaient pas reçus par les Américains. Donc, vice versa. Mais les Angolans, pour obtenir and weapons, to get diplomatic support, to get political support, they must join to one side. This brought a division among the Angolans. We were passing all the time, accusing each other, and uh, losing time keeping our fighting internal, not to fight against the colonial. Independence was within reach, if only the three movements could agree to sit around the same table and decide the destiny of their country. After months of mediation efforts, the three delegations flew to the Portuguese town of Alvor to negotiate terms of independence. To go to Alvor, everyone was afraid. What will happen, what the Portuguese will do? Maybe we'll arrest somebody, we'll kill somebody. And when we arrived there, the leader, they don't want to eat, to touch anything to eat. They say, no, you are the young boys, you are the first to be to eat. When I will see one of the boys dying, I know that he's poisoned. Distrust was toward the Portuguese and distrust also among ourselves. We went to all of us to Penina Hotel. The first problem that occurred in Penina was the way the Portuguese put us. The ground floor was a place for the conference. The first floor was UNITA. The second floor was FNLA. The third floor was Empelier. The last floor was the Portuguese. We didn't like this structure. People just thinking that there is a plotting, plotting, plotting. We think that during the night, maybe Empelier was negotiating with the Portuguese government. So many news were circulating, rumors. Hey, pa, my friend, you are sleeping. Oh, that they are negotiating. You know, this is a very bad atmosphere. The FNLA and UNITA 
feared that their local opponent, the MPLA, would be favored by the new leftist Portuguese regime. But it soon became obvious that the Marxist captains simply wanted to end the bloody chapter of colonial wars. For a week, they sat around the negotiating table, hammering out Angola's transition to independence. We said, first of all, when are we going to be independent? And the date of November 11th was proposed by Bushionet. He said that uh, 11th of November was the armistice day, and we should be independent on that day. Let's be frank. The Three Liberation Movement participated for the struggle for independence. There is unanimity. But who will be the first president? There was not agreement. The Alvor Agreement vaguely outlined the transition, but the shaky deal did not provide a solid basis to overcome the years of mutual hatred. It needed no more than a spark to revive the fighting. The three leaders wanted to be heads of state before elections. They did not want to wait for November 11th. Each one brought its own army. On a commencé à apprendre que les fédérés étaient en train d'introduire des armes. Parce qu'ils voulaient, avant la, la programmation de l'indépendance, prendre une position. Alors, la décision qu'on a prise, c'est expulser les gens du FLNA et l'unité de Luanda. Each faction tried to gain control of the capital. Whoever held Luanda on the night of November 11 would be officially recognized by the outside world as the legitimate government of Angola. As the fighting intensified, the superpowers stepped in to fan the flames. This was no longer a civil war in the far corner of Africa. The crisis quickly turned into a full-blown superpower confrontation, where Angola was no more than the battlefield. This struggle in Africa broke out after Vietnam. The United States was highly sensitive at the time to the fact that it had been driven from the field in Vietnam and that our opponents, uh, namely Moscow, would take advantage of this period of American weakness or the perception of American weakness to secure geopolitical gains elsewhere. If the MPLA achieved power with its strong connections to the Cubans and to the Russians, you would see the first serious physical penetration of the East Bloc into African affairs. And we regarded that as a strategic threat. We provided arms and financing to hire uh, mercenaries, provide trainers, provide weaponry, uh, to El Roberto's uh, armed elements and through Mobutu that equipment and funding was put before the uh, FNLA. Les aérons ont commencé à envoyer quelques unités pour les aider, n'est-ce pas, pour les encadrer. Et après, ben, l'aide a augmenté. Et chacun devait aider ses alliés. C'est tout à fait normal. Les Soviétiques l'ont fait pour le MPLA, n'est-ce pas. Les Américains ben, l'ont fait pour le FNLA Unita. Une opération américaine montée par le gouvernement américain, officiellement. Il n'y avait aucun secret. Not only the Americans were keen to contain the possible Soviet influence in the region. To the south of Angola, apartheid South Africa was eyeing developments with concern. Communism, as far as South Africa was concerned, was a real threat. A threat in the sense of dictating, taking over. Um, uh, the whole of the country. And we couldn't have that situation here in South Africa that they could come through and instigate and uh, plant the uh, ideology of Marxism here in Southern Africa. And that meant we're the next target. We're the cherry on the cake. The South African Defense Force decided to move into Angola. There, they immediately found natural allies in the local movements that had been chased out of Luanda by Neto's leftist MPLA. I, one who received the generals, 
from South Africa. And I remember the commander of the troops tell me clear, who are you? I say, I am George Valentin, representative of UNITA. I don't know. You are not Empire. No, I am a UNITA. I'm sure, I'm, a, I'm afraid. I don't know. I didn't receive orders to find the UNITA here. We came to defend the FNLA and to fight against the communists and so on to arrive in Rwanda to put the FNLA in power. But there is the UNITA. They stopped to phone to Pretoria to ask what we can do with the troops of UNITA here. À l'époque, l'Afrique du Sud représentait l'horreur, l'apartheid, mais le cadre était différent et la, et la guerre avait dépassé ben, nos niveaux. Le conflit s'est internationalisé. Et entre deux mots, vous choisissez le moindre. Pour nous, à l'époque, c'était le moindre mal. Évidemment, c'était l'apartheid. Eh bien, on avait besoin de l'aide. Malgré nous, on a accepté ça. Ça, c'est la vérité. That phase was the phase of guns and the money. You don't have guns and money, you don't have power. You can have dreams. You don't have, you, if you have no guns, you have no, no, no money, no politics. The scheduled date for independence was approaching fast. With U.S. logistical support, the FNLA troops, accompanied by soldiers from Mobutu's regular army, advanced from the north. UNITA soldiers, along with the South African army, moved up from the south. The MPLA, despite receiving consignments of Soviet weapons, suddenly found itself at a disadvantage. Y Angola lo que necesitaba era combatientes y armas allí, en ese momento. Cuando están los surafricanos avanzando, no, no se puede esperar el 11 de noviembre. Si esperamos el 11 de noviembre, llegan los surafricanos y llega eh, Mobuto a Luanda y no hay independencia. Y Neto, y se envió un mensaje al gobierno soviético, pero ya ellos no estaban dispuestos a hacer nada dentro de Angola hasta el 11 de noviembre. Pero nosotros sí estuvimos dispuestos Temos aproveitado imenso da experiência da Revolução Cubana. Sentido, por outro lado, uma solidariedade extraordinária do povo. Um entusiasmo que não podemos medir. Quando nós decidimos pedir a Cuba uma ajuda, fizemos uma um pedido formal. Pois é, a mensagem chega, de fizer é muito maior. Então ultrapassa-nos. O nosso pedido é ultrapassado. É de só vocês vão ser esmagados. Não é só isso que vocês precisam. Quando se produz o 23 de outubro, la invasión de Angola por tropas regulares de África del Sur, no podíamos cruzarnos de brazos. Y cuando el MPLA solicitó nuestra ayuda, le ofrecimos la ayuda necesaria para impedir que el apartheid se instalara en Angola. Nos teníamos pedido, sé la, un poco rebusados. Y él dice, no, un poco rebusados, no, se precisan... 80 sacos de azúcar, eh, tantos litros de agua, preciso una misturadora, preciso... <risos> Él trouxe un, un plano mucho más completo. Y e como no tengo ainda cozinheiros, yo tengo cozinheiros aquí, yo puedo mandar. <risos> This was not to be another covert operation like those Cuba had conducted in Africa throughout the 1960s. Fidel had decided to engage overtly in Angola. Cuba's elite special forces were dispatched, along with 35,000 foot soldiers, to help Neto's men. Operation Carlota guaranteed that Cuba would play a major role on the Angolan battlefield. The Cubans in Africa 
застала нас совершенно врасплох. Мы ничего об этом не знали. Пришла телеграмма от посла нашего в Гвинее, что садятся самолеты с кубинскими значит, войсками на борту, солдатами. Значит, у нас схватили за голову. Просто было недовольство. Недовольство, что вот э, кубинцы действуют без не посоветовавшись и действуют неосторожно. Но grande cantidad de hombres para Angola. Eso no se puede hacer en secreto. Se puede mandar un 10 personas en secreto, se puede mandar 36 mil hombres en secreto. Es una operación abierta. Но я знаю некоторых членов руководства, которые, так сказать, наполовину возмущались. Ну как же они без спроса, понимаете, идут там авантюру. Ну вот, ну пришлось примириться. Что, что делать? Никаких э, санкций мы не предпринимали в отношении Кубы. Они имели уже советское оружие. Уже имели. И мы, повторяю, если бы вот э, серьезно значит, возражать против этого, нам надо было с кубинцами поссориться. Куба была предпольем к Соединенным Штатам. У нас там были военные сооружения, важные для нас. Как стратегический пункт Куба была очень важна. Мы были волнованы о кубинском вмешательстве, потому что на этом стадии разговоры о ограничении стратегических вооружений были происходили. Было разговор о Брежневе в визит в Соединенные Штаты, который никогда не происходил, кстати, после этого эпизода. My assumptions then were that the involvement of the Cubans was Russian-driven. It took me years later to reach a different conclusion, that the Cubans uh, played to bring the Russians in in support. Uh, that news reached Washington in the summer of 75, and I remember it was greeted with considerable concern. This is the first time foreign military forces had been introduced onto the continent of Africa since the colonial period back at the turn of the century. First time. We felt at that point that it was necessary to face this Cuban issue head on, square on. Cuba is a red flag in the United States because anything that Cuba does, we hate. So when they send troops to uh, Angola, We had no choice but to say this is the end of detente, even though the Soviets really were not responsible. To see Cubans operating anywhere outside of Cuba was something that we considered a defeat for the United States. ¿Y por qué están irritados? Porque lo tenían todo planeado para apoderarse de Angola antes del 11 de noviembre. Angola es un territorio rico en recursos naturales. Cabinda tiene grandes recursos petroleros. Algunos imperialistas se preguntan por qué ayudamos a los angoleños. Que qué intereses tenemos nosotros allí. Ellos están acostumbrados a pensar que cuando un país hace algo es porque está buscando petróleo o cobre o diamante o algún recurso natural. No. Nosotros no buscamos ningún interés material y los imperialistas, es lógico, que no lo entiendan. Porque seguían por criterios exclusivamente chauvinistas, nacionalistas, egoístas. Estamos cumpliendo un elemental deber internacionalista cuando ayudamos al pueblo de Angola. All the pieces were in place for a final showdown. It was only a week to November 11th and all the warring parties were converging on Luanda. It seemed that the new nation would be strangled at birth. The final clash took place at Kifongondo, only 30 miles from the capital. But the battle of Kifongondo was a battle decisive. Well, we wanted to arrive at Luanda 
Et c'est la vérité pour empêcher que le PLA proclame de façon unilatérale l'indépendance. Il faut faire un sandwich, non C'est difficile. Foi... Mais tu vois que muitas vezes nous dormimos à penser comment nous allions défendre. Foi quand, então, a unidade, assim, cubana, uma companhia que chegou aqui, foi no dia anterior à Batalha de Pangoni. Chegou uma companhia do cubano, que se lembra meu bem. Foi uma coisa surpresa, né? Não foi dizer que a gente sabia que iam chegar. Só ficamos satisfeitos quando soubemos que na retaguarda estava uma companhia de cubano. E isto desde que os cubanos conseguiram desembarcar em Cabo do material de guerra que foi transportado a altas horas da, manhã, da noite ou quase já de madrugada via os tais órgãos de Stalin, os lança-foguetes de 40 canos. Quando os cubanos começam com os canhão, ou com os morteiros e os órgãos de Stalin a fazer um, uma preparação de fogo incrível. Na primeira foca que eles utilizaram, eles fizeram lá, os órgãos de Stalin. Isso foi formidável, isso foi manipulado pelos angolais. Quando eles vão. Bombarder avec ça, ben, nos hommes qui n'étaient pas habitués, ben, c'était la grande panique. The MPLA won the decisive battle at Kifongondo. And on the night of November 11th, 1975, 400 years of Portuguese colonialism ended. Augustino Neto was recognized as Angola's first president. Fidel tinha mandado uma caixa que era tudo de tabaco coiva. E o Neto que não fumava, e o presidente Neto manda pedir fósforo. E alguém trouxe o fósforo e ele acendeu um tabaco. É a primeira vez na vida que eu vi o presidente Neto dar uma bafurada. Quando toda a gente começou assim a estranhar-se, a dizer, olha, olha. Ele repara que estão todos a olhar para ele e dizem assim, <laughs> the fighting did not stop with the Declaration of Independence. The United States did not recognize Neto's presidency and was more adamant than ever to dislodge his Soviet-backed government. But the American Congress feared that they would get entangled in another Vietnam. So they decided to prohibit all U.S. clandestine support to Angola. Once the U.S. supplies dried up, the MPLA managed to contain its local rivals. The South African army also withdrew from Angola, but it continued to arm and train Jonas Savimbi's UNITA rebels. Augustino Neto had won the first round of the battle for independence, so he invited Fidel Castro to celebrate the victory his army had helped win. It was a moment of glory for Cuba. Since the 1960s, Fidel had supported no less than 17 African revolutions, but none of his ventures had been as successful as this. African leaders competed to express their personal gratitude. For three weeks, Fidel toured the continent where he was treated as a hero of African independence. Cuba's internationalist policy had finally borne fruit. In the late 1970s, Angola no longer made international headlines, but Augustino Neto 
had not yet managed to end the civil war. Jonas Savimbi's forces continued the guerrilla attacks from the south of the country. Soneto requested that a Cuban contingent remain in Angola to help the National Army. In 1979, Neto died before seeing his country attain true and stable independence. It was his disciple, the young Marxist ideologue of the MPLA, José Eduardo dos Santos, who would now have to confront the coming battles. Less than a year after Neto's death, Ronald Reagan was elected president of the United States. His vision of the Cold War was to alter the course of events in southern Africa. Reagan uh, felt, uh, as a strong Cold Warrior, that we wanted to do everything possible to counter the Soviet Union. And there was this feeling that we want to do to them what they did to us. And it wasn't just Africa, it was the entire world. And he saw Angola was a perfect place because there were Soviet advisors, Cuban troops, a government that was very pro-Soviet. So he says, how can we counter the Soviets there, make life difficult for them the way they made life difficult for us in Vietnam? The broad message was that America is back. We were going to engage in a more, shall we say, a more robust diplomacy in which uh, the use of power in all its elements, not just military, but diplomatic, strategic, economic, was going to be, uh, was going to be used. Reagan wanted the Cubans out of Angola, and U.S. policy in southern Africa had to concentrate on achieving this objective. The American plan was to propose to the African leaders something they desperately wanted, and in return, link that offer to the withdrawal of Cuban troops from Angola. I guess I was inspired more than anything else with a conversation I had with Julius Nereri, the then president of Tanzania. He said, um, Mr. Crocker, the Southern African process must begin in Namibia. That's where, it must, that's where you must focus your efforts. That's where you must start your efforts. Namibia is the key. He didn't really want to hear a lot about Cubans in Angola. He recognized ultimately that we were serious about that agenda, but he said begin in Namibia. Since 1975, South African troops had conducted the war in Angola from Namibian territory. But when South Africa pulled out of Angola, its troops remained in Namibia. SWAPO, Namibia's liberation movement, regarded the apartheid government as colonizers and demanded their immediate withdrawal. Their case won support in 1978 at the UN when Resolution 435 unanimously demanded that South Africa evacuate its troops from Namibia and granted full independence. But South Africa refused to withdraw, and SWAPO in turn decided to intensify its armed struggle from its military bases in neighboring Angola. The apartheid regime felt besieged, but they were reluctant to conduct another full-scale invasion of Angola. The alternative was obvious. Jonas Savimbi and his UNITA rebel army, which South Africans had continued to arm, needed the proper means to eliminate the border threat and ultimately rid them of the incumbent Marxist regime in Angola. We had to sell the Savimbi. Savimbi was fighting a war, and he was fighting the Soviet Union, plus the Cubans. And we had to sell him as a product. He had to go to the White House. He had to meet the President of the United States. Then that would have elevated him amongst his own people, and we needed him to be in that position. We used the Christian religion to extent to portray Savimbi and what he was doing here in Angola uh, to uh, salvage all the damage done by the MPLA towards the church. And we made videos of uh, Dr. Savimbi and we showed it in America. And that video changed the attitude towards Savimbi. And because of that, we got him through. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. 
Jonas Savimbi was, like much of Africa, willfully misunderstood by American politicians. If you know nothing about a place, you feel free to paint it with your own fantasies. And for many Americans, Africa was the land of Tarzan or Shaka Zulu or some other romantic, preposterous figure. And Jonas Savimbi fit in that category. Uh, for the right wing, he was a sort of Robin Hood. For the left wing, he was a diabolical monster. Well, he was a very charismatic personality with a good speaking voice, with a tremendous amount of, of self-confidence. Uh, he was a, a kind of physical leader. Uh, some people would say warlord. But he could also sit across the table and engage in an extremely impressive, erudite conversation in six different languages. This was a very accomplished personality. And, and his very facility with uh, cross-cultural communication made him effective internationally. He was able to go to visit the evangelical people in Texas and Mississippi and Louisiana and get their support. And this was very strong Republican territory. So they started saying, well, here's the true anti-communist, the man who can beat the Soviets in Angola. And Reagan got caught up in all of this and treated him like a hero. Savimbi got the international recognition he sought and became Reagan's new best friend. UNITA became the most sophisticated liberation movement to date, but Savimbi wanted more. Reagan said, uh, my friend, what can I do for you today? And Savimbi said, uh, President, I did not come here to ask for money. I did not come here to ask for military uniforms or boots or even medicines. Then Reagan said, but what do you, what do you want, my friend? To say what you want. You, you don't want money or nothing. What on earth can I give you to help you? And Savim said, Mr. President, this time I came here to ask you for the stingers. <laughs> When he said stingers, Casey stood up and said, Mr. President, this is a restricted weapon. Even our friends in Saudi Arabia do not have it. Then Reagan said for a few seconds like this and looked at Casey and said, the man wants stingers, give him stingers. Like that. The man wants stingers, give him the stingers. We weren't that enthusiastic about the Stingers. But uh, basically, uh, he made a very good military argument. He said that if I can neutralize the Angolan Air Force, and if I can neutralize their, uh, their tanks, that's all I need in order to complete my ability to stalemate the war. That was their objective. It was not defeat of the MPLA. It was negotiations. While the CIA was busy strengthening Savimbi's military power, Chester Crocker's team at the State Department were struggling to sell their peace process that aimed to get Cuban troops out of Angola in return for South African departure from Namibia. Through Americans, they said, no, senor, you have to retire the Cubans from Angola. And we said, the Cubans from Angola came to Angola para defender Angola do sul africano, não é da UNITA, é do sul africano, são um perigo aí na fronteira. E então, a única forma de que as tropas sul-africanas não sejam um perigo para a nossa fronteira é que os sul-africanos também se retirem da Namíbia. E aí, a parte cubana estava de acordo. Ele dizia, bom, se a nossa retirada leva a que haja um país africano que se torne independente, disse, de acordo. Do the South Africans go first or the South Africans wait for the Cubans? You can imagine the kind of discussions we had with this interesting cast of characters. The South Africans said, we may consider implementing Resolution 435 once all the Cubans have gone home. <laughs> Thank you very much, we said to uh, Foreign Minister Vic Boda, but that won't sell. And by the same token, the Angolans said, of course, once the South Africans have gone home, there's no problem, we don't need Cubans, it's not an issue. So <laughs> why do you have to negotiate it? it? It stands to reason, it will just happen. <laughs> So we'd say to the Angolans, try selling that in Pretoria. <laughs> you know. Six years of shuttle diplomacy and very little had been achieved. Time was running out 
and Reagan's second term as president was coming to an end. The warring parties wanted to negotiate, but each needed to fortify its position before sitting at the negotiating table. The MPLA forces asked the Soviets for help to crush Savimbi's stronghold once and for all. You had the uh, Soviet doctrine coming through, hard and clear. You don't stop, you attack, you attack, you attack. You do the same thing, you go to hiding every day, but you couldn't care less, you come, you come. That's what happened. I mean, first of all, they threw in 21st Battalion. It got a hiding. Then they threw in 59 Battalion. It got a hiding. Then they threw in 47 Battalion. It got a hiding. Then they withdrew. Durante varios años, el pensamiento militar nuestro y el pensamiento militar soviético en Angola no se pusieron de acuerdo. Porque los asesores soviéticos Gente brillante desde el punto de vista de la guerra, para hacer la guerra mundial, para tomar Berlín. Sin embargo, no entendían bien lo que había que hacer en Angola. Pero bueno, los soviéticos eran los que asesoraban a la FAPLA. Era soviética, no era cubana. Por lo tanto, ellos decidían. Nosotros podíamos dar nuestra opinión, no estamos de acuerdo, pero bueno, si quieren hacerlo, pueden hacerlo. Nosotros no somos dueños ni de Angola, ni de la FAPLA, ni de la Unión Soviética. No participamos. The Angolan troops and their Soviet advisors were routed at the Lomba River. The Soviets left behind a litter of burnt-out vehicles and discarded equipment. Over 2,000 Angolans died in this battle alone. To make matters worse, part of the army was encircled. The Cubans could not stand by and watch their allies being crushed. They felt, I guess, that they had to listen to the Soviets when it came to military advice until the Lamba River fiasco and, and uh, the initiative of Fidel Castro coming forward and saying, Soviets don't know how to fight in African wars. We do. El 15 de noviembre, reunión del Estado Mayor y la dirección, presidida por Fidel, se tomó la decisión y resolver el problema de una vez y para siempre, expulsar a los surafricanos de Angola. Para expulsar a los sudafricanos de Angola no eran con 10 hombres ni con los 20.000 que teníamos. Se requerían grandes fuerzas antiaérea, aérea, blindados y artillería. Sacando de nuestra propia fuerza, sacando las de Cuba, toda la, la, la mejor artillería antiaérea que tenemos en Cuba se envió para allá. Cuando teníamos aquí las amenazas de agresión contra Cuba, el gobierno Reagan, todo eso. Pero bueno, había que resolver aquella situación. As in 1975, the decision to send additional Cuban troops was not discussed with Moscow. In November of 1987, the Russian-Cuban relations were more tense than ever. The rise of Mikhail Gorbachev to power had visibly changed Soviet priorities regarding the Third World. В то же самое время у меня было такое впечатление, что Кастро с некоторым беспокойством взирает на положение в Советском Союзе. А уж с 1988 -го года дела пошли таким образом, что было не до Африки уже. Горбачев, когда пришел к власти, потому что в центре политики были отношения с Соединенными Штатами, перестал интересоваться африканскими делами по-настоящему. То есть мы убежали из третьего мира. Мы, так сказать, выражаясь старым языком, сдали все позиции американцам. It became more and more apparent to us that there were serious problems between the Cubans and the Russians. They feared Gorbachev and Reagan's coming to agreement. The Russians, for their part, uh, began to, because they couldn't afford it, cut back on the level of subsidy to Cuba, thus giving the Cubans even less reason to be beholden to them. And Angola, in this context, became even more important to the Cubans, even as the Russians came to see it as an embarrassment and an obstacle to better relations with the United States. It was that point that the Cubans made the decision to basically double the forces they had in Angola. 
basically, if you wanted to find out how many Cubans there are, you start counting baseball diamonds from satellites, and we could we could we could look down. <laughs> Cuban army regulations required a baseball field for every certain number of troops. So when they build a baseball field, a new one, you knew there was an addition of troops. When they closed the baseball field, you knew some had left. Massive Cuban reinforcements were flown in to rescue the trapped MPLA forces. The final confrontation between the Cuban, Angolan, and South African armies took place around the tiny village of Cuito Cuanaval. Now, if you see this type of air traffic, you've got to think. You've got to say, what the hell is going on? They started hating us. We knew where the operation headquarters were. We knew where the anti-aircraft was and the artillery, and we opened fire. Achava-se que se se ganhasse em Cuito Carnaval, pois estava aberta a via para avançarem para o norte de Angola. E era um ponto importante de defesa estratégica, mas é uma vila. As pessoas falam da cidade do Cuito Carnaval, aquilo é uma pequena vila. Tanto que nós, às vezes, trazíamos tropas, né? Tropas da, do centro ou do norte, vão para Cuito Carnaval. Então eles desembarcavam na pista. Então quando a gente botia num quartel, né? eu lembro que uma vez um veio para botar e disse, oh, chefe, Mas quando é que vamos à cidade do Cuito? Diz, estás na cidade do Cuito? Diz, é isto que eu venho defender. The whole effort was conducted by uh, Fidel Castro by telephone from Havana. He was a commanding officer. How you can do a thing like that, I wouldn't know. It, I mean, it's impossible. It gave us a problem from our side because we didn't know him. We didn't know his way of thinking, what type of personality he was. Because that's the thing you know, you've got to know in war. You've got to know the chap on the other side as well as you know yourself. You must know his strong points and his weaker points. That's how you're successful, otherwise you're not. The battle raged on, costing an estimated 25,000 lives. All sides claimed victory without managing to stop the war. The combat at Cuito Cuanaval lasted six months and became Africa's largest battle since World War II. La historia de África va a tener un momento muy importante, pero va a ser uno antes de Cuito Guanabal y otra después de Cuito Guanabal. La poderosa Fura, los Blancos, la raza superior, se estrellaron contra un pedazo de territorio defendido por negros y mestizos. Pero no estamos buscando ese objetivo. 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 Pero the only way out was a negotiated solution between governments, and that, by definition, excluded Jonas Savimbi. But before Crocker knew it, the Cubans came up with a surprise. Uh, well, I was in the National Security Council, and I got a call from Peggy Delaney, the daughter of uh, Rockefeller, and she said, I'm here in Cuba on some sort of a meeting of NGOs, and uh, Castro called me in and gave me a message. The basic message was this diplomacy is missing a critical ingredient. Yes, that critical ingredient is direct physical Cuban participation. If there were to be Cuban participation, this diplomacy would be more realistic and it would have better prospects for success. And the Americans continued refusal to talk directly to the Cubans and to include them in the negotiating process 
was a, an obstacle. <laughs> it would be difficult to imagine a more direct hint. So this led to a major dilemma. Do you sit at the same table as the Cubans? Now, Chester Crocker, of course, wanted to, but he knew that sitting at the same table as the Cubans was politically very dangerous inside the United States. Uh, so he went to see George Shultz, who very courageously said, I authorize you to meet with the Cubans, but you must talk only about Angola and Namibia. If they bring up the U.S. trade embargo or anything like that, refuse to talk about it. The meeting took place at the presidential palace in Luanda. The Cubans had finally earned their place at center stage. We knew they were next door because we'd been briefed. And um, at a certain moment, we said, OK, let's try. Let's see if we can make this work. Uh, invite your Cuban friends to join this process so they don't have to sit in the next room with earphones. They can actually be here at the table. <laughs> So in came the Cubans, and they were just as pleased and as proud as you could imagine. There were smiles from ear to ear. They were delighted. A sala toda com fumo do tabaco que tem cheio. Eu, muito satisfeito, a, com toda a intenção, fui com o meu tabaco para dar um toque cubano a, a la negociação. Os cubanos fumam o tabaco e somos os produtores dos melhores tabacos do mundo. The air became heavy for some of the uh, non-smokers in the room. Uh, Brisket, a very jolly fellow with a um, very, very sort of rotund presence, uh, very outspoken, and most of his interventions took minimum 20 minutes. <laughs> Primero hay una primera discusión sobre el cese del apoyo de Estados Unidos a la UNITA, y creo que le dice a los angolanos, bueno, pero el cese del apoyo de Estados Unidos a la UNITA es un problema entre angolanos y norteamericanos, no es cubano. Cuando vino el punto de la retirada cubana, el que estábamos dispuestos a estar hasta que se liquidara la PAGEI, Pero los angolanos no estaban de acuerdo en llevar la cosa tan lejos. Y la solución que habíamos acordado, solución global con retirada total. At last, the South Africans, Angolans, Cubans, and Americans sat to discuss concrete steps to end the war. But the fighting at Quito Cuanaval continued, and every minor victory or loss altered the givens at the negotiating table. The next meeting held in Cairo would make or break the peace process. When ministers get around a big table in a major capital like Cairo, they really can't help themselves. They, they just can't resist microphones. And, and they, they, they just go from bad to worse. And Risquet managed to say things about Cuba's heroic contributions to African stability and development and, and, and Cuba's uh, intention to see to it that uh, peace would come when there was an end of apartheid and when there was an end of this and an end of colonial rule in Namibia. And it was a meeting almost of emotional hatred, Mr. Risquet. He, he started by launching a vicious attack on us, vicious, saying you've always been imperialists, racists, uh, capitalists, you know, uh, uh, causing trouble wherever you went, etc., etc. At that point, uh, Puck Bota and, and, and Magnus Milan just went after the Cubans, and it, it was very dramatic. And uh, it was basically a test of manhood. A lot of testosterone in the atmosphere, I think, is the way to put it. Entretanto, começaram a haver declarações do Pico Bota, dizendo que Angola ia nacionalizar as tropas cubanas como angolanas para ficarem lá, ia casar cubanos com angolanas, né, para eles serem angolanos, um acerto de manobra. Né, assim, tá bem. Porque eles diziam que iam deixar aí cubano como casado, como matrimônio, para deixar tropa eh, camuflada. Um absurdo. Desde luego le contestamos con mucha fuerza, 
Leímos que no podíamos decir el número de matrimonio porque en Cuba el matrimonio es una cosa libre entre personas de dos sexos. Y ahí es que en Cuba ni en Angola había la Moral Act que había en Sudáfrica donde se prohibían los matrimonios eh, birraciales. Nosotros también queríamos hacer un pedido. Queremos saber cuántos negros están en prisión na, que estão nas prisões do apartheid da África do Sul. <risos> Se eu fosse jovem, <risos> jogávamos aqui a soco, e eu jogar pancada, porque eu não admito uma coisa disso. Não. Ah, e tá bom, intervalo. <risos> Acabar as coisas. It seemed the talks were headed for total breakdown. But later that night, an unexpected turn of events opened a new window of opportunity. We went for a drink uh, in this uh, pub in the Cairo Hotel. And there were some Cubans, including uh, Mr. Skid. Then we had a drink together and I said to him, has it ever occurred to you that we could both be winners? And he chuckled in his drink and he said, what do you mean? And I said to him, look, to put it in simple terms, if we carry on with this war, we will both be losers. If you withdraw your troops on the basis of having given Namibia its independence, your leader, Fidel Castro, can claim that he won. You claim a victory of a greater nature, namely the freedom of the people of Namibia you have achieved. And I say to the white voters of South Africa, I got rid of the Cuban troops in Angola. And our war is also ended. That makes us both winners. And suddenly I, I could see a total dramatic change in his whole attitude. After the Cairo meeting, a ceasefire at Quito Carnaval was implemented. But it wasn't easy to clinch the final deal. Having South Africa show its goodwill by at least releasing the legendary prisoner Nelson Mandela became a sticking point. The whole world was descending on us, apartheid was uh, viewed uh, as, as a prime evil. Uh, the release of Mr. Mandela was demanded. I knew that we had to reduce the tension to be able to release Mr. Mandela and the other political prisoners. If we could not do so, and the only way to relieve uh, uh, the tension in southern Africa was to come to an agreement and the war in Angola. By forcing the South Africans to trade the independence of Namibia for the Cuban withdrawal, that in the end justified everything to Castro, that he could think of himself as having been the father of Namibian independence and the end, the man who ended uh, colonialism in Africa. Cuba, in fact, demonstrated a level of responsibility in its behavior and maturity in its judgment that um, arguably uh, should have been uh, recognized by the United States as an important gesture deserving some response. Uh, but the politics of this in the United States, that is the politics of relations with Cuba, uh, are poisonous in the extreme, so in the end, Cuba, which acted responsibly and should have been acknowledged for doing so, got no such acknowledgement. On December 22, 1988, almost one month to the day before the end of Ronald Reagan's presidency, peace accords were signed in New York. The parties simultaneously signed documents granting Namibia's independence and ensuring the withdrawal of Cuban troops from Angola.
the withdrawal of 450,000 Cubans was scheduled to take place over 30 months, ending 13 years of Cuban military presence in Angola. A month short of the deadline, the last Cuban soldier left the African soil. With him ended the epic of Cuba's military support for African revolutions. Como habíamos dicho, de Angola solo nos llevaremos los restos de nuestros hermanos caídos. No nos traemos ni petróleo, ni diamante, ni nada, sino los restos de los compañeros que murieron. Y aquel 7 de diciembre, al mismo tiempo en todos los cementerios del país, al mismo tiempo, a una misma hora, recibieron sepultura a todos los combatientes caídos. ¿no? The total number of Cuban casualties remains one of the island's best-kept secrets. But military historians agree that at least 10,000 Cubans died in Angola. In that period that we retired the troops from Angola, there was also a battalion that we had in Punta Negra, in the Republic of the Congo Brazzaville, and the troops that we had in Ethiopia. In that period, all the troops returned to home. And from the day that the Che crossed that Che crossed, Aquel lago, Tanganyika, y llegó a Zaire, que fue el 24 de abril de 1965. Hasta ese 25 de mayo de 1991, transcurrieron lo que llamamos la gran epopeya de Cuba en África. Transcurrieron un cuarto de siglo, un año, un mes y un día. The means to achieve true independence may be different today, but this objective has never changed. The mythology of JFK's assassination and the psychic wounds left in American culture. All deconstructed by Storyville next Tuesday at 10.30 here on BBC4. All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you for sticking around. That was quite a long movie, but it was a very rich film full of all kinds of things going on. So now we're going to have the group discussion about what we just watched. And we encourage y'all to share your thoughts in the chat with us as we talk about it. But let's like open it up by asking like Ashi, Afrophoenix, Monica, like what are your thoughts on the movie? Well, I'm with Risquette. I, I, I do really like that period. That time was like just a great epic. Like, I think the Cubans really like became the only internationalists within that era who found themselves and played a role that really took on like that burden of just like, all right, I'm about to go help Africa liberate itself from you know, the detriment of capitalism and imperialism. So if you look at it, this is true epic. You know, they were putting in a lot of work, a lot of resources, and it's just exciting to watch overall. I think it was my third time watching it, and um, I didn't know anything about African solidarity. 
before I watched it. And then, of course, I grew up in this country, so I was a Christian at this um, Boston. Uh, you know, I was like, oh, like Che was doing that. And then also, I reflect on um, what I know, right? And um, when Cuba came to be in solidarity, like, and in the struggle, they supported what Emil Cabral wanted. And so that's so important when we support other people's movements, right? Um, across uh, countries, um, within the same um, territory or within organizations, like showing up what support looks like, what they define. So I appreciate like some that analysis. And then I also always appreciate the lies that this country tells, cause it's like the same lies over and over again so it's like yeah what like um what is it called um like when are you going to tell this lie again oh we're going to hear it next week <laughs> you know and so it's something to laugh at do you have any thoughts afro phoenix can you hear us uh, yes i echo the first part of what monica was saying about i had no idea this was going on um the the really the last portion of it i didn't have sound um I, I didn't have sound at all, yeah, um, from the film. But um, I, I do want to mention that I personally was fighting my own battles. I was fighting my own battles right here in the United States with, um, what is it, um, masochism and chauvinism, fighting men, beating up on me and stuff like that. So I was very involved in just personal survival at that time at that time and I was totally unaware of what was happening in, in you know on the on the outside. But uh that's that's not unusual um because this country lies so much and uh so everything was kept hidden from us. We had no idea no idea of any of these things that were going on. I learned from this documentary, yeah, like it's shocking how much of the history is hidden or when you hear about it in the mainstream US media, the framing is completely different. Like I can't even tell y'all how many times I've heard people in the US claim that Cuba was trying to colonize Africa, that they were like being backed by the Russians, like the US agents were saying that the whole movie. So it's just like very interesting, the narrative from the perspective of Africa and Cuba and the narrative from the perspective of like Western imperialist nations. Um, but one thing I wanna start with is the what happened in the Congo with Che's attempted solidarity mission because it was essentially a failure they were they failed in their objectives that they set out to accomplish in the Congo and there were multiple factors why that failure happened but it was interesting that that's what the documentary started out discussing and it was also interesting um how Cuba pivoted so like what did y'all think about that part I thought it was brilliant I really did I thought it was brilliant because it seemed to me uh, from what I gather, that um, as 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 always, the colonizers have come, come in and and spread uh, uh, divisiveness among the people. So we have all these people fighting each other, and uh, where the they should have been fighting the true enemies, which were the European colonizers and settlers. Uh, yeah, definitely, definitely a failure when you look at like what happened exactly right after Patrice Lumumba's death. Um, I, what I've learned is you you see the 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 UN uh, EU partnership uh, with the US um, and them taking over. Uh, well, it's a facilitated coup with Mobutu. As soon as Patrice Lumumba you know, steps up within like these speeches in the United Nations and he's he's declaring like this is the route that we're going to take. This is when all the forces start to like move in on them. And um, the facilitated coup is just so strong that, you know, it's Africans that end up, you know, persecuting him, his own people. And this this is uh, a, a parallel of like today on how um, succession movements uh, take out revolutionary governments today. So that's like, I feel like that is the case study right there to like look at and study, um, to, re to really just like look at how, uh, you know, coops are facilitated today because everyone thinks, you know, it's, it's this tension between Africans and, and different different African nations, but like, you know, why? 
why does these wars exist? And you can see that so much money and resources from Western imperialist countries are put into it. Um, and, and just so much planning and strategy that it's, it, you know, who, who can really uh, see it if it's, if you're looking at mainstream media or if you're living in the United States, um, it's something so careful that you got to pay attention to. So that was devastating uh, for the Congo and it still is. I think that I that I felt and my my heart swelled with love for for Cuba, uh, Kay and Fidel and and what what they did to help liberate the the countries in Africa, and so they were they spearheaded all of these uh, all these groups the revolutionary groups to go in there and help again as I said just just love Fidel Castro. I really do. Yeah, people in the chat were saying he's attractive, which I agree. Um, but also, yeah, just just the selflessness of the Cuban people, the understanding that they went there to assist with liberation struggle is not out of materialist interest, but because it was the correct thing to do. And then also in the Congo, like it didn't work out how they wanted. And there were multiple factors that contributed to that. Like just like as she pointed out, like as soon as the Congo won its independence, Belgium and the United Snakes and like all of these European powers moved to sabotage it. Like the CIA agent who like him, the State Department dude, the Security Council dude, like so difficult to watch them. Like you just want to punch them in the face. Like every time they come on screen. But he was like out in the open, like dropping those lies, attacking Patrice Lumumba's character. He like claimed that he asked for a woman. I was like, you're full of crap. I'm sorry. Because you, th in the next frame, you're talking about murdering him. But you're talking, you're, you're claiming that he asked for a woman. Whatever. Um, and then also, but an interesting thing he said was that as soon as Congo gained its independence, all of a sudden, like, all hell broke loose. Like, that's how he described it. All of a sudden, like, there was, there was, like, mass death and violence. And, like, they had no choice but to send in Belgian troops to stop the chaos. But if you understand what Belgium colonization looked like in the Congo, like they killed millions of people, like 11 million Africans in the Congo to loot that nation. So what kind of like peacekeeping mission that just just so happened to happen in the in the wake of independence could the Belgium be even capable of? Like they killed 11 million of those Africans, but that's what's going to keep them safe. So like it's always like this. Whenever nations resist imperialism, whenever nations overthrow colonization, what you see happening immediately in the media and coming from Western governments is this narrative of just like chaos. Like these people are not civilized. They need us to keep things under control. And that's how they justify intervention to regain control. Like the, the Russian, the Russian uh, speakers, the, the speakers from the USSR were straight up like that invasion of the Belgians was about controlling the Congo's resources for the West. It wasn't about keeping people safe. It wasn't about, it was like so chaotic that they just had to do something. It was literally like Belgium scrambling to make sure that they can continue to loot the Congo. So like, I feel like it's really important, like as she said, to understand like how these things work every time, every time they do this. Yeah, I think context, context is important. And although they didn't uplift, they didn't uplift all the different resources in the Congo, they talked about cobalt. So they talked about how that was only available in Russia and in Congo. And so we we see, you know, Belgium and um, the United um, Snakes like Empire uh, collaborating, right? To make sure that like one of them controls the power, one of them controls the resources, which means continued oppression ex and exploitation of our people. So of course they have to like frame it as, um, I mean, we just saw that recently with Haiti, right? They have to frame it as, we're, we're intervening to support aid. They don't know how to uh, take care of themselves, right? When it's, um, when there's, like you were saying, like, um, I can't even think about how many years it was, um, Congo was colonized, right? And all of the um, the evil, like bloodshed that happened to our people there. Uh, so that's what I think about. I think about that when, um, when they're talking about um, I think about like imperialism and how, and how, and how that one dude was saying that, uh, I forgot which country they called a fascist country. <laughs> like, wait, what? <laughs> like this country is the most imperialistic, 
And so it's just really interesting of how um, they always try to point out the evils of everyone else and like not look internally in the uh, United uh, Snakes needs to like have a big old mirror face in itself to see of all the atrocities that it's committed and in collaboration with other European imperialistic countries. So, and the other thing that they mentioned briefly um, was that there were secession. So as soon as the Congo gained its independence, Patrice Lumumba came to power because the people wanted him there. All of a sudden there were these secessionist movements in the Congo. One of the most notable was the Katanga province, which is an extremely resource rich province in the Congo. A lot of the mines owned by European corporations were in Katanga. All of a sudden Katanga was like, we want to become our own extremely small and vulnerable nation. And they aligned with the United Snakes and with Belgium. Like the documentary is made by the BBC. The BBC is the British Broadcasting Corporation. And so you're going to get, you're not going to get the full truth. It's very accurate in some respects, but like some of the things leave, they leave out, you're like, huh. And so that's one of the things. Like they briefly mentioned the secessionist movements, but what they didn't say is that the U.S. deliberately backed those movements to undermine Congolese independence and to undermine Patrice Lumumba. Because once Katanga tried to secede, the Congolese government, the independent Congolese government, lost all the revenue from that extremely wealthy province. And so it undermined their ability to provide for the basic needs of the people living in the Congo. That was on purpose, divide and conquer strategies. Also, are you gonna say something Afro-Phoenix? Oh, uh, what well, I was thinking of, I, I believe it was in the Congo, how, uh, what, the, what, I took that, is that the, the people were so colonized, they were so colonized, um, they were to the point of, they didn't, they had forgotten or never learned how to fight. And that's, that's what was amazing, amazing that they didn't know how to fight. It speaks and, to like how, how Belgium colonized the Congo. Because when like the British and the French colonized like, you know, parts of West Africa, they certainly engaged in like apartheid laws. They certainly made sure that African people um, were not able to like advance and develop in that society that we were oppressed. But they took the time to create a class of African people that they would control, like the new leadership and like the chiefs and stuff. Belgium, on the other hand, did not do that. They didn't even bother to recreate that class. They like destroyed all the indigenous African schools and did not replace them. So it wasn't even a, a, a situation where the Africans in the Congo were somehow like more backwards. It was that Belgium deliberately, deliberately underdeveloped them on that basis so that when they gained independence, they literally did not have a skill base when it came to the military, when it came to like diplomacy, when it came to like just like organizing a state because Belgium stopped them from doing that. So I want to be clear, like that was certainly a factor and what was happening, but it wasn't because they were backwards, it's because of what Belgium did. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just like um, um, uh, the analogy of enslavement of, of, uh, of the Africans that were stolen out of Africa and spread all around the world, the diaspora. They, they were just totally um, mentally, emotionally, psychically, and spiritually all um, in bondage uh, where they, they lost absolutely everything, absolutely everything in the, in the enslavement process. Yeah, yeah. again, um, and, and, and the, ones that, the, the ones that stepped up to the plate, you know, like um, uh, the, uh, all the all the leaders that stepped to the plate, but again, some of them were misled too, misled because they thought that the the, the Western powers were going to help them when they realized that they were, you know, that they were not going to help them because they had no interest in helping them. Uh, the one thing that I remember too is that um, Castro was saying that. Um, they think that the only reason why they have interest there is because they want to steal everything. And so he made it straight. So they all made it straight that they weren't there to take and steal. They were there to help to liberate the people. Well, let's talk well, about I, I, that. that um, because okay. Patrice yeah. Lumumba um, traveled to the United Snakes to attempt to get support for the Congolese independence movement. He attempted to work with the UN. He asked for the UN to come to the Congo to help keep the peace when the reactionary forces 
attempted to undermine the Congolese state. We know in 2021 that the U.S. and the United Nations are not forces that are in support of African national liberation. Um, but do we think, like, why do we think Patrice Lumumba did that? Was it a mistake? Was it just because of, like, the perspective or perception of the U.S. and the U.N. at the time? Like, let's talk about that. Um, uh, simple words, double crossing, you know, and um, just really um, making making uh, Patrice Lumumba think that they that they, they were their friends and allies, or they were just using them, using them to advance their own causes. They were just there, steal and take again. In in a word, in a few simple words. Um, I'm proud. Go ahead, uh, Monica. Perhaps you can shed some light on that. I didn't mean to talk over you, Upper Phoenix. Go ahead and keep going. No, 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 no. I'm, I'm done. I, and that's why I say go ahead. I want you to elaborate. I was just going off of what you were sharing. I was thinking about um, how the film talked about like um, the U.S. empire being this like humanitarian country. And it is really good at putting on that persona of like being... Um, humanitarian and always wanting to like share a helping hand. Like I continuously talk to people who are African and they're like, oh, look at what they're doing in Haiti and how they're helping. And like, they have no idea and no clue. And so I think the attempt was genuine and intentional of really trying to get help for, um, help for the people. Like, I don't think, I don't wanna say, I don't wanna use the word mistake because what it allowed, it revealed like the true um, intention of like this country. And he would have never known if he didn't approach it because again, I just think like this country is really good at hiding those things, especially because I think about what um, the anti-war coalition, the panel about what, what Ramiro talked about, about like the media and the controlling of the media. And when you look at it, you always see the US empire doing some type of aid, some type of help, um, anytime there's a disaster. Um, however, they're, they're causing the disaster and they're not really helping. It's all about control. Um, and like the help that they're really doing is putting more um, militarization, putting more weapons and actually doing more extraction. And so I could see like back during that time, there was this probably persona um, of it. Cause like we see it now, we have to break it down all the time um, to our own people. Indeed. So, yes. Um, the other thing too, I remember another another um, article that we had read is about the United States when they come supposedly under the guise of helping, it's always they come with fangs, dripping blood, dripping blood. And and another one, old one too. White man speaks with fork at tongue. Uh, no, I definitely agree with uh, Monique. Uh, I think it, there, was, there was a state of oblivion at that time with him. It, I mean, he definitely had, I think that was some some criticism for him during that time was like, that was his weakness too. It's like, he went there and I think the CIA agent even said it too. It was like, he tried to play East against West. That's an old game. Um, and uh it's, it's almost as if like he doesn't know how much the Congo is at stake for the U.S. at that, that time when he's talking to him. Because if we go back to like the minerals, like 45 to 65 percent of cobalt and all those those minerals that go into aircraft and like military equipment, that's a huge stake for for like power. So like to go in there with not too much of a, like a plan and like kind of and then right after get assassinated, it showed some weaknesses for me. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, I, I was always like questioning that too. It, it, like whenever I saw that part in the documentary, I, I was just like, Hmm, I like, I would, I, it was too easy. I was like, ah, I, 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 it probably should have went over, went over a little bit different for me, but, um, I, I almost didn't believe it almost coming from like the way he represented, uh, before he went to the U S but. I think he kind of was oblivious of it and tried to play, you know, East against West or like, you know, was looking for allies. Um, and the, the U.S. does uh, 
give themselves to the world in this democratic way. And especially at that time, like we're the leader of democracy at the time. Um, so it was, it just hit them in the face um, at the end of the day. Word, I agree. And I do feel like the way that the U.S. was perceived, especially the U the way the U.S. was perceived and the way the United Nations was perceived at the time is very, very different than it is now. Like Monica said, like back then people were like, okay, let's give it a shot. Even Kwame Nkrumah and like other revolutionary Pan-Africanist leaders were like working within the U.N. and like trying to like do things with the quote unquote right way when it came to independence. But what they realized as like revolutionary African government was overthrown after revolutionary African government was that uh, these nations or these, these entities were gonna be moving um, in the interests of the West and that they were opposed to African liberation. But like Monica said, they had to find that out because the perception at that time, and actually the narrator even said it, she said uh, the US had no history of colonization. And I was like, word? But then because, because, because what was, if they had no history of colonization, what happened to the indigenous people? Like, why, why were your Africans enslaved here? But that was the perception. The perception at the time was that the United Snakes was not a colonial power. That's what it was. And so Africans were like, all right, because that was the propaganda. At first they bought it, but then they learned. Another thing, though, um, that I want to talk about is um, the U.S. So the U.S. Uh, backed the Katanga secessionist movement. Again, Katanga was a research is a resource rich province in the Congo. Ha, uh, pulls a drastic amount of the Congo's revenues, and when they moved to secede, they undermined the the Patrice Lumumba government. The U.S. also backed uh, Mobutu, who was like the person that stabbed Patrice Lumumba in the back and took power after Lumumba was assassinated. And in the Congo and in a number of other African revolutionary struggles, the U.S. backed counter-revolutionary forces. It wasn't like U.S., like a bunch of Europeans on the ground working to undermine Congolese independence, working to undermine Angolan independence. It was actually quite a number of Africans. So let's talk about that. Also, we also want to talk about Dave Chappelle's mama, because that came up in the chat. We can talk about that as well. What was your last statement? Please repeat. Um, so Dave Chappelle's mother, who is a woman named Yvonne Sion, worked in the administration of Mbutu in the Congo. After Patrice Lumumba was assassinated and Mbutu came to power, Dave Chappelle's mama worked with his administration. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I remember now. Yeah, I remember. Yes. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy um, uh, that 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 you on Sanyu, that you got all this background of knowledge. It's just wonderful that we have you to really open our eyes and show us what's going on because it is very convoluted. And, uh, you know, just watching that film to actually what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. I, I wanted to express that. Yes, indeed. To have have someone like you teaching us what's really going on. Another thing I was thinking about too, I really hate this time of year, especially this time of year. Supposedly all of this, all this, um, all, 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 you know, a period, but uh, we're coming up this so-called holiday about Thanksgiving where in, in reality and actuality, what really happened was that they were celebrating the genocide and the imperialism that that they brought they brought to these to these lands, and so I don't celebrate none of that shit, none of that shit, because I know what it's really about. It's because of what they were doing. They were busy imperializing and 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 genocide and and destroying and destroying the land. That's what that's what this period always brings forth for me the so-called Christmas, Thanksgiving, all of that. And for the people who are really affected. So they are happy because they were the conquerors. They were the invaders. And they were the killers, the murderers. Mm-hmm. 
and uh, just look at the founding of this country. Thank you, Alpha Phoenix, for you know pointing that out. And um, so the first part of Anya Sabu's question, I think about. I mean, it was so hard to see. Uh, you know, it's hard to see um, our people turn against each other, and um, that's strategic. And there's always somebody in the background, like helping to play that role, and it benefits. Um, only um, the oppressors, like it doesn't benefit us. And we see that um, in spaces. And so that's why revolutionary work is so important. So we're able to see that we're connected and our struggles are connected and like really know who the enemy is. And that's why like Cuba came in solidarity because their enemy is our enemy, right? And so those are things that we have to really learn together. And so seeing that um, is really hard to do and and um regarding the second part of your question i don't i can't recall the article as as like i should even though i like i read it like a couple weeks ago about um dave Chappelle's mom so if you want to elaborate on it but i just think about um how it's so easy to turn our people against each other and when we're not in communication and when we can't see the macro level picture about what's happening it's easy to like do the infighting. And so that's something that we have to address. And the way we address the infighting is um, like what Malcolm X says, like we wake up with sleeping people. And so that's how we address the infighting. And because um, generationally, like this infighting has been going on, um, it works towards the enemy's goals. And we have to be working toward our goal, which is a one unified socialist Africa. Excellent point. Thank you so much, Monica. Um, so basically what happened in the Congo is that the liberation forces on the ground were not at a level of organization where they, they even could have taken power if the, the Cuban support had been successful. But also the Cubans didn't necessarily understand the culture. A lot of them didn't understand the language. They didn't understand what the conditions were on the ground in the Congo. And so all of those factors combined with, of course, what the moves that imperialism was making doomed the Congolese mission. But the Cubans did not leave it there. They didn't just like give up after that. Che Guevara was like, we can still make a contribution. And they all believed it. And so he traveled across the African continent, building um, strong, principled relationships with other African anti-colonial organizations. And so the documentary goes on to describe uh, Cuban support of the PIGC's revolution against Portuguese colonialism in Guinea-Bissau, and it unfolded quite differently um, from how it unfolded in Angola. So let's talk about that. Thoughts on that? Oh yeah, because when they saw when they saw that um, that uh, what did they say? They used the 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 um, analogy of um, David defeats a Goliath, and that's what they did. They really did, and. And so that was, and that, that resonated across the whole continent uh, about uh, that they can be defeated. And as we have witnessed and learned from the past is that that always happens when, when the people who are the rightful um, inhabitants of these countries is that with their determination, their grit, and 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 the, the the feeling of autonomy and sovereignty that they can defeat them because the oppressors all they're after always is money, riches, resources, um, and and the land. But um, they are always always defeated. So that's why we 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 will and always will have hope that we will be victorious. Uh, yeah, with the, when it comes to Guinea Bissau, um, Bissau, um, I, they were like the perfect candidate. So like, that's when Castro or uh, Fidel was just like, you know, he was looking for the right country or like the right place to actually go to send his troops. And um, th that was based on like Guinea Bissau having, you know, organization from Amil Cabral 
um, on the ground, and it resonated into like, all right, this, these these uh, these Africans is ready to fight. So like, this is this is the place to go. Um, so I, I I was I was impressed by that for sure, uh, and just trickling just a little bit back because it wasn't really talked about in the documentary, but with Mobutu, and like this question of like obliviousness during that time, he didn't even know like truly the the complete like intentions of the West. Because if you go back and see articles on like Mobutu, he's he 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 wants to get rid of the Belgium eventually for he can have his own Pan African like uh, military, uh, but they keep with negotiations. They don't send help when he when he's asking for it, and he's really expecting like more resources to go into the Congolese army, uh, and he's just not getting it. And then the the West is up against him and his intentions because um, they don't trust him. You know, so it's you really can't trust the ideology if it's completely different. But um, when it comes to Guinea Bissau, I think yeah, you saw in that partnership was beautiful. I thought that was really like really amazing to see Castro go to Guinea Bissau and help Emil. Beautiful. And, and what was it that that they, that the West they tried to assassinate like Fidel what six hundred thirty five times or something like that? Some preposterous times that they tried to. They killed him, but he survived and died of old age. If you really study the history of imperialism, there are so many times where it took an L. Like, we're taught that it's invincible. We're taught that we can't beat them. But really, if you study the history, we've actually beat them quite a few times. So, like, certainly mm -hmm. Fidel Castro dying of old age, surrounded by his loved ones, was a defeat for imperialism. Certainly African nations winning military victories against NATO powers was a defeat for imperialism. Vietnam was a defeat for imperialism. The Cuban Revolution was a defeat for imperialism. The Haitian Revolution was a defeat for imperialism. We have won many, many, many times. This documentary is about several times that we won. So it's always important to keep that in mind. Did you have any thoughts, Monica? No, I don't have anything else to contribute to that. I, I echo and agree with what's been said. An interesting thing um, that was said in the documentary, it was said by several of the Cubans, but it was also actually said by Amical Cabral, just wasn't mentioned in the documentary, that the Cubans were not there to fight the liberation struggle for the Africans in Guinea-Bissau. They were like, the Africans have to do this. And like I said, the Cubans say it in this documentary, but Amical Cabral said it himself, that we don't want Cubans leading our military contingents. We don't want Cubans doing any work that Africans are capable of doing because we have to win this for ourselves. Like, why do y'all think that they took that position? I think going back, go ahead, Offer Phoenix. Go ahead. I think going back to what you said, Anya Sabu, like the people had to believe that they could do it and that, and that it could happen. And if somebody else comes in and leads it, then it's still like um, it doesn't empower the people right to to lead and fight for their own liberation and fight for their own revolution for their own people. And so that was really critical. Um, the other thing I think about which the documentary didn't talk about is um, the organizing in Guinea Bissau that happened, like how everyone's leading, how everybody has a role, how everyone's fighting for the liberation, even the children have a role. And so I think that's really important as well. And so um, if somebody's trying to break in my house, I need to defend my house, right? I need to defend my home. If somebody comes in here and has to do it for me, I'm going to always feel weak, but I'm empowered um, if I have the tools myself to do it. Thanks, so. y'all. So 100% agree. So the last thing I want to talk about is Angola, keeping support of the MPLA. Uh, the revolutionary anti-colonial struggle there that again was successful, another military victory against the forces of imperialism led by African people and supported by Cubans. I want to keep reiterating that because it's very important to understand that the Cubans would not have had anything to do in Africa if there had not been independent revolutionary African movements on the ground to lead them. They couldn't have gone there on their own to free us. We had to lead those struggles and Cuba provided support but we were the ones that won those struggles but so in Angola um, the Cuban revolutionary forces supported the MPLA 
in their struggle again against Portuguese colonization or colonialism. Um, again, we see some sellout agents in the form of UNITA, African forces that at one point aligned with apartheid. Like there was a UNITA member in the documentary. He was like, we, we, have, we were faced between communism and apartheid and we chose the lesser evil, which was apartheid. And I was like, that's out of control. <laughs> like, what did y'all think about that? It reminded me of Ahmed Shakur um, Toure when he was talking um, talking about women women um, uh, uh, of Guinea aligning themselves with the oppressors um, and, and keeping themselves um, in bondage, literally. And uh, so he denounced that, and 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 that very it very much it sounds similar to what what was going on here. They 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 um, align themselves with the oppressors and take on that role to help help um, keep themselves um, oppressed. And another thing I think about too was. Um, and it's, uh, the analogy that we use a lot here in the in the West is Uncle Tom. You know, they're part of them, but they but they feel that they're part of, and they uh, owe allegiance to the oppressors. Yeah, I definitely agree, uh, Afro Phoenix. I think also, uh, like right next to that is. Um, and one of the uh, Angolan clicks mentioned it in there. It's if you don't got guns or money, you know, you, you don't got power. So I, I felt like at that period of time too, it was like the pressure of, of of winning or taking back your territory. It's if if you don't have those means to do it, like this is when the question of like sacrifice comes in. And I think the West really appeals to like our weaker sides. Um, when it comes to that issue and a lot and that's this what causes just so much conflict uh amongst africans so it's it's it, it goes back to is like man all the all the reasons and strategies and tactics that go into us hurting ourselves um it, it's it's intentional it's still intentional in a way Right just, on, right on. <laughs> wanting to point out that the YouTube channel is uh, popping. The comments are popping. And when Anya Sabu, you talked about how it's important for us to um, study um, ways that our, our people and others have fought like imperialism and won. And wanting to point out what Erica said in the comment, um, even earlier before you said that, um, she shares, makes a good argument for the importance of studying national liberation struggles in Africa. So like, it's really important. I'm thinking about how important it is to learn about wherever our people are, um, the struggles that they're doing and the fight that they're doing, because um, what we've al always learned is one side of history. Like we only learn about um, the enslavement of our people, but we don't learn about um, the struggle and the fight. And so I think that is so important. And that's what this film also elevates, right? Is um, victory. And so, um, and, and also learning, learning through things that may we may have not won, but the learning that happens in that, right? In order for us to um, uh, come out victorious. So I, I definitely wanna explore that, learning about the struggles um, of liberation um, um, on the continent. And someone pointed out in the chat yeah. another thing about the the Unita guy that said we chose the lesser evil of the lesser evil being apartheid um, was the same guy tried to frame communism as antithetical to Christianity, and in the same documentary, there's Cuban be like I I believe in Christianity, like you know what I'm saying? Like the framing of it was so wild that communism was regarded as this existential threat, and so that meant that straight out like apartheid rule like minority settler rule, like imprisonment and violence towards African people on their own land was preferable to even the possibility of communism. Like that is deep indoctrination and actually directly relates to what we were talking about in the anti-communism and um, imperialism panel earlier in this week, how the West has successfully been able to frame communism again as an existential threat and in doing so justifies like straight up atrocities, like mass killings, 
um, and, and wars in support of fascism and colonization all to stop colonialism. So seeing an African person repeating that really shows you how deep that indoctrination goes and how widespread it was. They were really willing to allow their land to continue to be colonized by these oppressors that have killed millions of their people in order to stop the possibility of communism. Meanwhile, the anti-colonial forces were like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Like, we are going to get rid of a pie head no matter what. And they, that was who won. But yeah, it was just really wild. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, um, I, I think about all the, uh, what you were talking about indoctrination, Asanya, because I, I know that, um, I remember when, um, when the supposed the Cold War was going in. And uh, so uh, we were supposed to uh, duck under your desk in case of a nuclear war, which was just totally ridiculous um, that uh, you were supposed to duck and hide under your desk. And uh, that's just how they, they, they lie and they scare and they perpetrate all of these untruths, falsehood, just straight out lies. Speaking of lies, Go ahead. Speaking of lies, like so throughout the documentary, the CIA agent, Larry Devlin, the State Department people, the National Security Council people, all of the U.S. talking heads basically are constantly invoking the threat of the USSR. They're constantly like, the USSR is controlling the Cubans. The USSR is controlling the Africans. We have to stop. We have to counter the USSR in Africa. Like all, like just all of this like consternation and angst about the possibility of the USSR making moves in Africa. And then we get to Angola, and Cuba's like, the MPLA asked for support. Cuba's like, okay, we'll show up. Russia's like, can you not? And Cuba's like, we're going to do this. So, like, Russia wanted nothing to do with it. Nothing whatsoever to do with it. But the U.S. was convinced, convinced that the USSR was, like, secretly orchestrating everything. It was orchestrating the anti-colonial struggles. It was orchestrating Cuba's involvement. Like, there was no evidence for this whatsoever. But the U.S. was convinced that this was going on. Why do y'all think that was happening? I mean, yeah, definitely. It, it, I, I'm, I'm guilty because they be getting me on that one too. <laughs> like, especially when I catch up with like current events, like with the war in Syria, it's still regional. It's, it's right there with Russia, and like they're still there, but like Russia and the U.S. is there. And like, but when you go back, yeah, it's it's in that time the pressures of the Cold War definitely influenced that whole thing. So. It's, 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 that's something that you gotta be careful of too right there for sure. But uh, I, I know we, we, we talked about that in the comments. Uh, I definitely have to be like, yeah, let me, let me just pause real quick because like, it's just a game. It's just a political tactic. <laughs> I agree with you. Like it's, it's, an, it's a political tactic. Like they know Russia is not involved. Stop that. Like, <laughs> stop that. Stop that. But um, but saying it saying it sounds good, right? Sounds good to make it seem like uh, uh, another enemy is in play to actually because um, it's making it seem like our people can't organize. It's making it seem like our people are weak that we can't fight our own battles. Um, but I agree, it's a political tactic, and they're always using it. Like even in the spook that's at by the door, they're like, "It's the Russians." <laughs> but, it's, it's like, a, you know, that recycling thing that we talked about earlier, like, and so that's their go-to. Even like the 2020 elections, they said the Russians stole the, and we're just like, what are you talking about? Not 2020, 2016, um, because Hillary Clinton lost and they couldn't, they wanted to save face and it was the Russians and they just kept the lie going for years. It's still going. Now they're saying Russian energy weapons are creating like uh, brain illnesses and U.S. spies, like all kinds of stuff. Like the Russians are like the go-to big bad for the United Snakes. And precisely what Monika said is what's happening. That Cuba is a majority African nation. These are Africans in on the continent, like defeating Western imperialist powers. The U.S. cannot accept that African people have our own agency, that African people have our own independent revolutionary analysis. Even in like the Black Lives Matter movement in the United Snakes, people were suggesting that there was Russian backing. When uh, uh, Africans didn't want to vote for Hillary Clinton because she's been racist for her entire life and has, and has like acted upon that racism in all forms of policy, people were like, oh, they must be being manipulated by the Russians. The New York Times said that. 
This is like a go-to. It's both saying that non-European peoples are not capable of sophisticated political strategy. And it's also just like putting up this like convenient big bad that can cover for all of the dirty the U.S. is doing. And their own ineptness too. I I was reminded of when when they um, when they uh, freed Ansatawa right under their nose, and they were just bumbling idiots. Phoenix is talking about there's like a video on YouTube of like raw news footage from the night that Asada Shakur was broken out of jail by members of the Black Liberation Army. Oh. And it's like literally just uh -huh. 20 minutes of like police officers looking very confused <laughs> and like being asked questions and like not being able to answer, being like, we don't know. Like, who was it? Maybe they were black. How do you know? We don't know. Like, it's just very, very funny. You should check it out. Um, but so the, the MPLA asked for support. Cuba answered. The USSR was like, we can you please not do that? We are involved in negotiations with the United Snakes over the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were concerned that um, intervention in Angola would jeopardize those talks. Cuba was like, no, we are going to do this. At one point, one of the Russians is like, we understood that if we tried to tell them not to do it, that that would damage the relationship. So Cuba was like, we are going to support the African liberation struggle. So what do y'all think about why Cuba did that? Like, why was it that the USSR didn't want it to happen? And that Cuba was like, we're going to do it anyway. And then also the U.S. star was like forced to, to like accept it. Like, thoughts about that? Because I, I think it was because uh, that, that they, the Soviet Union, they were just concerned about their own backs. They weren't really interested in helping, weren't really interested in helping, whereas the Cubans were. And so they didn't want to, uh, uh, didn't want to ruffle the feathers of the, um, of the super, the other superpowers. They're making like a calculation, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, who was it? Risked or like Fidel? But you know, he he wasn't looking for at the end. He said, you know, I wasn't looking for the uh, the ultimate victory of like winning this war. We we're just gonna get the end of our apartheid after at the end of this. And I think that was the that was the biggest stake too. Is like, you know, we're fighting against apartheid right now. Something that can obviously like we're totally against ideologically, and we don't we don't want that to be the be the case. We're, we're already a movement of uh, internationalists and thinking. So like, uh, this this is a very important battle for us to come and take place in, and um, it's it's worth it's worth the bloodshed. They definitely got that. Uh, one of the things I really wish that they had uh, explored more in the, the, all the different uh, revolutionary um, countries that, that, that came, came in defense and in support of the revolution that was going on in Africa. So I, I, I would have liked to have learned more about these different countries. It was very interesting because what Cuba and the MPLA did was stop the spread of apartheid in Southern Africa. Like it's really important to understand that the minority seller government in South Africa didn't just intend to keep their nonsense in South Africa. They wanted to build apartheid regimes across the entirety of the Southern part of the African continent. So what the MPLA and what Cuba were able to accomplish, no, most notably at the Battle of Quito Cuanavale, was stopping the spread of apartheid in Southern Africa. UNITA was like willing to let that happen, to see many, 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 many apartheid regimes pop up across Africa. The MPLA and Cuba were like, absolutely not. And really, if you think about, you know, what apartheid is, it's really just reactionary or reactionary settler movement. They are moving to consolidate their control of our lands and our resources. It's not just about it being a racist regime. It's literally the institutionalizing of a materially exploitative relationship. It would have locked down their control of Southern Africa's resources for generations. And so when the Unita guy was like, we chose the lesser evil, like he was full of crap, y'all. He was full of crap because that would have threatened Africa's ability to liberate itself for years to come, decades to come. 
So what they did was actually really significant in terms of Africa's overall objective of liberation. If they had been not um, unsuccessful, uh, all like the whole southern part of Africa would have had apartheid to this day. So another really interesting thing um, that came up was that the U.S. Congress passed an amendment prohibiting all U.S. clandestine support to counter-revolutionary forces in Angola. And after that amendment was passed and the majority of the aid ceased, it proved decisive for forcing that conflict in favor of the revolutionary African forces. When I actually learned about that from this documentary, I was like, wait, what? U.S. Congress did what? So like, yeah, thoughts about that. Like, did y'all think that was possible? I didn't think it was possible. Uh, uh, paraphrase that one more time. Uh, so the U.S. Congress passed a amendment. It's called the Clark Amendment that prohibited all U.S. clandestine support to Angola. The U.S. had obviously been providing military and financial aid to UNITA, which was like aligning with the apartheid forces to attempt to recolonize Angola. The U.S. Congress said no more money to counter-revolutionary forces in Angola. They passed a, an amendment that banned that funding and it proved decisive in like turning the tide of that anti-colonial struggle. So for clarity, real quick, because I don't think I caught that. So they um, they banned giving counter-revolutionary money. They banned I'm a, it. I'm gonna reflect, reflect on the question. <laughs> it's wild because I'm a person who, when people like are like, Congressional Black Caucus, you should condemn what's happening in Haiti. I'm like, they're not gonna do that. But what that shows is that they can be pressured to move in anti-imperialist ways. Like the body itself still remains imperialist because the U.S. is an empire. But given particular conditions, Congress can actually move in anti-imperialist ways if they believe that intervening in these ways is like contrary to the interests of the United States. Like that seems to be what happened. Like the, the military defeat that the United Snakes and NATO forces suffered in Angola was like so embarrassing and also happened on the heels of another great embarrassment in Vietnam that these like Congress people were like, what are we doing? Like they didn't want to do it anymore. So like it really shows like how much was transformed by these revolutionary anti-colonial struggles in Africa and by the support of the Cubans. Like they created an anti-imperialist act of Congress with that pressure, which shows you that those people can actually be moved. I look so skeptical. I'm just going to sit with it, but I think you answered it when you shared the last part of it, when you were talking about, like, they were embarrassed that they're, like, losing. So it's like, it was a way, it was an easy decision to make, to do, right? Because then now they disconnect themselves from the cause. Uh, so that's interesting. If they have an interest involved, they can move that way. I'm going to sit with it still. It makes me think about like, how could we get them to do that again? Like, for example, the US blockade on Cuba has been escalated repeatedly in the middle of the pandemic. It's forced and keeping people to suffer. At the same time, we see increasing attempts on the US, part of the US government to overthrow the Cuban revolution, to cause instability in Cuba. Same things happen in Venezuela. Same things happening to Belarus, all these places around the world that are, uh, Nicaragua, all these places around the world are facing U.S. imperialist intervention and like the U.S. left right now is like powerless to stop it. But way back in 1976, which actually wasn't that long ago, the U.S. Congress passed an amendment banning precisely that kind of intervention in Angola, which shows you that it can be done. So like how do we as an anti-imperialist movement, as revolutionary organizations, create the conditions in the belly of the beast where that will happen again? Because if we know what's possible and we know the force for evil this empire is, then we have a responsibility to get them to do it. That's real. And someone else just posted in the comments too that we should do that with Valenzuela as well as Cuba. And so one thing that I think that's leverage is uh, in, it might've been June or July, it came out that saying 70% of people in this country believes that the blockade shouldn't exist, that it should end. So like, um, and we also see, still see 
those messages that they're sending about like um, what socialism really isn't, but like for them, what socialism is, right? Or what communism is. So we have to like counter that as well. But I wonder what it could look like with mass mobilization and people really putting pressure on. And I know there was when the UN had the meeting around, um, like every year they vote on this and they vote to end it except for Israel and um, the US empire and a few other countries wanting to keep the blockade there. Um, like they say, like email your congressmen, email your legislators. And so like me, I was like, well, why would we do that? Because like this system doesn't wanna like change it, but the people want it. So if the people organize to say, no, what this is doing is actually um, um, killing people. It's actually creating economic distress. So I wonder what it could look like as at like as an organizing strategy, but like at a massive scale, where people are actually talking about it. I don't recall what doc what film we were watching, but I saw um, politicians um, like condemning imperialism, condemning. And I was like, what, what is this? And I've become like, cause this politician now like sucks, but then you were like, what is this? And it was because the pressure was there, right? The pressure was there to do that. And so I wonder what does that look like? I don't have an answer. I think you asked a really good question. And I think that's why the solidarity work that we're doing, that people are doing all over the country in solidarity with Cuba, like the car caravan, the demands, um, the media messages, but 70% is a lot of people, right? Um, so I feel like there's leverage. Like how do we translate that mass support into like, yeah, action into actual power? Because I really feel like these people are not, they're not gonna stop attacking Cuba, Nicaragua, Venezuela, Eritrea, Ethiopia. They're not gonna stop attacking these anti-imperialist nations because it's the right thing to do. They're just not going to they're going to do it when they feel scared to do the alternative like that's what they're gonna do like they have to be forced to take these positions either by embarrassment through military defeat or a popular movement a mass movement which has the power base um to enforce these demands so yeah um were you gonna add something actually oh no you just said it right there i mean like trying to imagine how, how it happens yeah like you can only say it in, I think, those statements. Like, it has to be, like, a mass uh, conscious that, you know, it's, it's not just, like, you have to affect all U.S. interests. So, like, even the state of, the, the fake state of Israel, like, it's it's even over there, too, because that's the pressure on the U.S., too, and all their territories. So it's definitely mass, and it's hard to imagine, but, like, that's truly it. Like, that's why revolution never goes away. Um, and there's figures in... And during the time we just like watched about where, you know, it's, there's there's this figure like Franz Fanon, who's like, he's known, he's castrated by the West for telling telling the world that violence has a purpose. Um, but he's saying it in a revolutionary way for the Algerians at that time. But, you know, and, and the West is castrating them completely. Like this guy's prescribing violence and they're using the language, like uh, they're even willing to like put, uh, admit up to colonialism and the the cat the uh, the catastrophe of colonialism and say you know better than what we used to be, but then they they still do the same they still have the same program so like it's so easy in neo colonial colonial states around the world now to like use that revolutionary language against us and it's is you gotta attack that like you definitely gotta call everything out and just like constantly move on it so. I think Castro is ultimately right when he's like looking at it from an internationalist perspective and he's like using his militias to like support these places. Um, but you know, you know, that's that's looking at that on a more wider, larger perspective. We need all countries to kind of kind of like play their role and then let that infiltrate and like traverse and transpire into revolution. It's tough, you know, but tough to imagine. That does seem like the answer. Also, I think the politician you were talking about was like Maxine Waters, because like when RSD was overthrown, she was like, what do y'all do? And I know Maxine Waters for some intense corruption and alignment with imperialism. So when I saw that, I was like, whoa. But yeah, it's, again, more evidence that in like particular cases under particular conditions, like we can move even imperialist ass members of Congress 
towards anti-imperialist positions. We just have to create the movement that can build that pressure, both domestically, but also internationally in Pan-African struggles. Um, the other thing I want to say, which I really appreciate that Monika brought up, like the car caravans and like the Cuba solidarity work that's happening in the United Snakes, because what happens is that when U.S. or Western imperialism attacks these nations, even so-called progressive forces in the United Snakes will join in on the attacks. Like the U.S. left is really like some jump in ass bitches in that whenever like the U.S. imperialist forces are like, we're going to overthrow this government, we're going to invade this country, we're going to sanction this country. A lot of forces of the U.S. left take that as their opportunity to engage in so-called criticisms of these anti-imperialist nations. And I'm like, so the time when you feel like it's best to share your thoughts about the mistakes of these projects are when they're being like assaulted by imperialism. Like, like that's the best time for you. But it happens repeatedly and it helps the U.S. like create the narrative that justifies their actions. It's straight up victim blaming. It's straight up bullying. And people have to stop, like stop for the love of God. You know, when Patrice Lumumba was assassinated in the Congo, there were segments of the U.S. left calling him a dictator. When Kwame Nkrumah was overthrown by the CIA, there were segments of the Western left calling him a dictator. Every single time that you can see an anti-imperialist nation being overthrown, being invaded, being undermined by imperialism, you can find segments of the Western left helping it happen from the left. We have to stop. It has to stop. We have to understand that we are the revolutionary force in the world that has not actually pulled our weight, those of us living in the United States. We have to understand that when we engage in critiques of revolutionary projects who have accomplished things that we haven't even begun to, that we are not actually being helpful. It's just straight up chauvinism. It's just straight up white supremacy coming out of our mouths. So I just feel like it's really important. Like if we want to build those movements that can have that power, that can apply that pressure, that first we have to learn how to like act in a principled way, engage these nations in a principled way, like support the revolutions, even with contradictions and understand that we don't have a right to say that they deserve what they get for making mistakes. They actually have the right to make those mistakes. Like it's just really like a continuous failure of forces in the US left and the Western left in general to support these projects because we don't see them as like the idealistic version of them we've created in our heads. I just need to say that because I hate it. <laughs> any, other, um, any other thoughts um, on the film or anything we talked about so far? <laughs> no, I just want that though. Definitely, I definitely feel like the left and liberal groups black liberal groups in the united states it's just a matter of like their ideology does not it's just it's not sufficient it's, it's, it's not enough for like what africa needs where the african diaspora needs and what oppressed people need it's, it's just not enough how about you monica no i'll just just reflecting and appreciating um, the essence of this film, like appreciate always the knowledge that I'm able to uh, scoop up in this space and even in the comments. Yeah, people were like very entertaining in the comments today. We really appreciate you. <laughs> like it was both very funny and very informative. We had some very aggressive porn bots and people just kept it moving. I appreciate y'all. But one thing, I guess like where I want to end is that there was a speech that Fidel Castro gave at the end when the MPLA and the Cubans forced the U.S. and NATO to the negotiating table, forced Cuba's presence in that space. The U.S. did not want them there. MPLA was like, no, 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 they're going to be there. And the U.S. had to concede. It was amazing. Um, but Fidel Castro gave the speech where he says, the superior, the so-called superior race has come unstuck on a little piece of land defended by Africans and mulattoes. In that statement, what Fidel Castro is saying is that the anti-colonial victories in Angola across the African continent against these imperialist powers showed that white supremacy is a lie, that these people are not better than us, that they're not more civilized than us, that they're not somehow more entitled to our land and resources that we are, that we are the same and that they are vulnerable and capable of defeat. 
like the anti-colonial struggles in Africa, the support of the Cuban revolution showed that white supremacy is a lie, that these people can be defeated if we are organized. So I really feel like that is the overall lesson of this history, that if colonized nations around the world, anti-imperialist nations around the world unite in our struggles, support each other across borders, that we can defeat these empires. It is possible, it has been done before. Oh my God, there goes the porn bot again. Damn, that's like account number seven. Honestly, it's a little bit impressive. Anyway, so, so, I'm like, how many, do, are you, is it like a person and you're just like logging in frantically, like you get blocked and then you like log into the next one? Like that's really wild to me. Anyway, so it's, it's been about three hours. So we can wrap this up now. Thank you for joining us for the November Pan-African Film Series. It has been a great conversation. We appreciate your views. We appreciate your contributions. Some things to keep an eye out for on here in Tiwa Territory on Sunday, November 21st. We are going to be having our next Cuba Solidarity event because Cuba showed up for Africa and we are going to show up for Cuba, period. So if you are in Tiwa Territory, please come join us at Robinson Park for a rally with speakers, with a facilitated group discussion, with free food, all in solidarity with Cuba. This coming week on November 15th, we are anticipating more US imperialist shenanigans on the island of Cuba, more attempts by the US government to subvert the Cuban revolution. And so then weekend afterwards, we are gonna show up for Cuba. We are gonna say, we see what y'all are doing and we do not accept it. So if you're in Tiwa territory, please join us Sunday, November 21st at noon. Uh, at Robinson Park for that rally. Also on Saturday, November 27th from 10 a.m. Mountain Time to 4 p.m. Mountain Time, the Benson Emma's Brigade is presenting the Cuba Land Back and Environmental Justice Conference. It's going to feature a panel discussion of speakers from Cuba, Zimbabwe, and indigenous nations in the United Snakes talking about taking the land back. We're gonna have a seminar about Cuba's 100 year plan to fight, fight climate change, Tarea Vida, Project Life. And we're gonna have a workshop about how you can learn how to organize your own Cuba Solidarity car care van in your city. It's completely free. It is completely virtual. We hope that you can join us. It's going to be a great time. And I will put that registration info in the chat. So please join us on the second Sunday or second Saturday in December for the next Pan-African film series. And we hope to see you soon. Please stay tuned for some music and some flyers for upcoming events. El presidente anaranjado Viendo que las elecciones las perdió Solicita a los que le hacen los mandados Que se apuren pues la fiesta terminó Y mirando que se va a acabar el varo Han formado un titingo Se han negado a abandonar la Casa Blanca A la silla del despacho se amarró los pelitos que le quedan los arranca Bataleando por la rabia que le dio Y mirando a Cuba con sus patas blancas De cabeza se tiró El que tenga confusión que se confunda El que quiera claridad que venga a ver La jugada no es compleja ni profunda Está claro cómo quieren proceder son los falta que nosotros los dejemos Y eso no va a suceder Con la conga de los hoyos no te metas No te metas, no te metas Cuba viva sin que nadie la someta No te metas, no te metas ¡Ah! Mi tierra linda, mi cubanía Mi bandera se respeta no Defiende lo tuyo cubano No te metas, no te metas Que no te metas con mi tierra Que mi Cuba se respeta No te metas, no te metas